Good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone here in Carson City and there in Las Vegas, as well as anyone watching online. Uh, welcome to Assembly Judiciary. With that, Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Here. Assemblywoman Gallant. Here. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblywoman Newby. Here. Assemblyman Orentlicker. Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Present. Assemblyman Urich. Here. Chair Miller. Here. And it looks like everyone's here now. Great. So with that, just a few reminders, asking everyone to please turn off all of their electric devices to make sure we have no disruptions later, phones, laptops, all of that kind of stuff. Again, committee information is available on Nellis. Also to let everyone know that while we're up here, it may look like folks are on their laptops and devices and all that kind of stuff. Uh, please understand people are working, people are communicating and people, members are researching and, and digging into other data and stuff. So please, I don't want anyone to take that as a distraction or inattentiveness, but it's just part of the process as uh, members are up here working. With that, we will at the end of today's hearing have a public comment section where the public can uh, comment up to two minutes each. Of course, the public comment section is not to be anything pertaining to the bill that we're going to hear this morning. We also, so again, we have one bill on, on the agenda for today. And I'll discuss that bill a little more when we get closer. First, we do have eight bills on work session today. So because we have members that need to get to other morning committees, we are going to start with the work session uh, documents first. So with that, I'll have Ms. Diane Thornton, our policy analyst, walk us through the first bill on work session, please. Thank you, Chair. Diane Thornton, Legislative Council Bureau. Our first bill on work session is Assembly Bill 14, which revises provisions relating to the state business portal, sponsored by this committee and heard on February 21st. There's one proposed amendment. Um, the Chief Deputy Secretary of State proposed an amendment to delete the bill in its entirety and instead in its place establish the business license working group within the office of the Secretary of State. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, are there any questions on Assembly Bill 14? Uh, Assemblywoman um, Bill Bray Axelrod, not Summers Armstrong. Bill, Bill Bray Axelrod. I know there's too many of us hyphenated, or not enough. Um, OK, so my question is, who, who did that amendment? Um, the amendment? Who offered the amendment? It's offered from Secretary of State. And it's to gut? the whole bill and make it a study. It was in a, in a working group that was combined with Assemblywoman Newby and Secretary of State staff. Thank you for that clarification. So it is a friendly amendment. Thank you. Any additional questions? All right, not seeing anyone. I will entertain a motion to amend and to pass Assembly Bill 14. Motion to amend and to pass. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? second. I have a second from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Members, are there any additional comments on the motion? All right, with that, I will take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? And the motion passes unanimously. I will assign that floor speech to Assemblywoman Newby. You're welcome. Ms. Thornton, next bill. Assembly Bill 125 revises provisions relating to public safety sponsored by Assemblywoman Backus and heard in committee on March 6th. There's one proposed amendment to the bill. Assemblywoman Backus proposed an amendment which does the following. First, it revises Section 3 to be permissive due to jurisdictional concerns when a report may be taken and to also add additional factors of when a missing person may be entered into the NCIC. And additionally, it adds co-sponsors to the bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Ms. Thornton. Members, are there any questions? So Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod? I am so sorry. Um, am I, did I list myself as a co-sponsor on that? And if not, could I add myself? 
Not at this moment. We won't be adding to that. Okay. We have to be a floor amendment. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right. Not seeing any. I will entertain a motion to amend and do pass 125. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola, and I heard, was that Assemblywoman Considine with the uh, second. Members, any additional comments on Assembly Bill 125? Yes, Assemblywoman Hansen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I will be yes in committee. I, I still have some um, issues trying to work through before floor, so, but to get it out of committee, um, I'll be a yes at this point. Thank you. Thank and you. I, I will let you know if something changes. Perfect, thank you. Was one of those issues Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod trying to sign on? <laughs> that, that totally wrecked it for me. <laughs> thank you so much. With that, members, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Nay. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we have two nays. Uh, Sorry, I'm nay. Okay, so hold your hand up, please, so we can get our nays accurate. Okay, so we have Assemblyman Gray, Assemblyman Yurick, and Assemblywoman Galat. Proceed. I'm going to reserve my right on this one also to change my vote on the floor if the uh, if law enforcement's concerns are uh, addressed. Okay. So with that, the motion passes, and I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Backus. Ms. Thornton, Assembly Bill 160. Assembly Bill 160, revised revisions governing the sealing of certain criminal records sponsored by Assemblyman Miller and heard in committee on March 7th. There's two proposed amendments to the bill. The first amendment uh, does the following. First, it revises section one by requiring the records communication compliance division of the Department of Public Safety to compile a recommended list of eligible records and transmit it to the administrative office of the courts. It requires the administrative office of the courts to develop and implement a process to review, approve, and transmit to each court with jurisdiction each eligible record. It establishes certain procedures for the sealing of eligible records. It provides that the administrative office of the courts must report yearly to the legislature the number of records identified eligible for sealing. It provides that the Central Repository for the Nevada Records of Criminal History and its employee may access, require access into and inspect any records sealed. It adds a new section creating the Advisory Task Force on Automatic Record Sealing. It amends NRS 179.245 to provide that by January 1st, 2025, the AOC may issue any rule or regulation to streamline the process for filing a petition for record sealing as recommended by the task force. Additionally, it amends NRS 179A to provide the legislative intent concerning the enhancement and modernization of information sharing amongst criminal justice agencies, and it revises the effective date of the bill. There's a second amendment proposed by Teresa Benitez Thompson from the Office of the Attorney General. This would include NRS 41.910 in sections 5 through 7 of the bill, which is the Certificate of Innocence. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. With that, members, are there any questions? Not seeing any, I will entertain a motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 160. Motion to amend and do pass. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? A second from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. With that, members, are there any additional comments? <laughs> yes, Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I know there was a lot of work done on, on this bill and on the amendments, and um, I'm going to be a no right now, even though I feel more comfortable with the amendments and in hopes that I can get to a yes, because I, I do think this would be beneficial. So that's where I am at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments? All right, not seeing any. Uh, all those in favor of Assembly Bill 160, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, so we have Assemblywoman Hansen, Assemblywoman Gallant, Assemblyman Yurick, Assemblyman Gray, and Assemblywoman Hardy. And with that, the motion passes. I will sign that floor speech to Assemblyman Miller. Ms. Thornton, our next bill, please. Thank you, Chair. You also see this is how we're clearing the room so everyone can sit down. <laughs> 
Assembly Bill 193 revises provisions relating to custodial interrogations of children, sponsored by Assemblywoman Gonzalez and Herden Committee on March 1st. There's one proposed amendment, Assemblywoman Gonzalez and Nathaniel Erb, policy advocate from the Innocence Project, propose the following amendment. First, it amends Section 1, Subsection 1 by deleting at any time concerning the certain requirements relating to custodial interrogations. It amends Section 1, Subsection 1A, providing that a peace officer or other person authorized to conduct a custodial interrogation of a child is prohibited from knowingly making material false statement rather than provide false information regarding certain evidence. It amends Section 1, Subsection 2 to provide that information obtained in violation is presumed to be involuntary and inadmissible in any criminal or juvenile proceeding. It provides a rebuttable presumption, provides that the finder of fact is required to consider the totality of circumstances of the interrogation and provides certain exceptions if there's an imminent threat to life in property. And finally, it revises the effective date of the bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any questions on Assembly Bill 193? Assemblywoman Bray Axelrod? Assemblywoman Bray Axelrod, what's going on with your laptop? It finally just started. I apologize. I'm sorry. I woke up late. I apologize and remembered we had work sessions, so I didn't read these this morning, so I'm re trying to read them now. Did we address the fact in this bill, because I had notes about that there's never a parent in Yes, please, Assemblywoman. I have no parent during interrogation in Nevada. Thank you so much for the question. Um, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16. Um, so the reason that a parent is not required is, is that was not the intent of this bill. I would love to work on that in the interim. I think um, there's an appetite for that. Um, I think also we worked on the um, Miranda juvenile rights last session, and so that not that it's like in place of it, but that is currently what they are using. Um, We're gonna, you're concerned let's, for let's talk, we'll talk. Yeah, awesome. We'll talk offline. Okay, okay. I'm gonna be a yes out of committee. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions, members? All right, not seeing any, I will accept a motion to amend and do pass. I have a motion from, to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 193. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Do I have a second? I have a second from Assemblywoman Mosca. And with that, members, any additional comments? Not seeing any? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Nay. So our nays, we have Assemblywoman Hansen, Assemblywoman Gallant, Assemblyman Urick, Assemblyman Gray, and Assemblywoman Hardy. And with that, the motion passes, and I will sign the floor statement to Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Ms. Thornton, our next bill. Assembly Bill 275 revises provisions governing the sealing of criminal records, sponsored by Assemblywoman Hardy and Herden Committee on March 14th. Assemblywoman Hardy proposed two amendments to the bill. The first one would add a new paragraph to indicate that the petition must, if applicable, include a statement certifying that the petitioner was a victim of sex trafficking. And secondly, it adds co-sponsors to the bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Members, any questions? Not seeing any questions, I will take a motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 275. Motion. I have a motion by Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? I have a second by Assemblyman Urich. Is there any additional comments on the motion? Not seeing any, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And the, and the motion passes unanimously. I will sign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Hardy. You're welcome. Next bill, please, Ms. Thornton. Assembly Bill 371 makes various changes relating to parentage, sponsored by Assemblywoman Cohen and Herden Committee on March 28th. There's one proposed amendment. Assemblywoman Cohen and Kimberly Surratt from Surratt Law Practice propose the following amendment. First, it amends Section 59, providing that a child support agency may facilitate rather than order genetic testing only if no acknowledged or adjudicated parent of a child other than the parent who gave birth to the child. It amends six, Section 63 by deleting Subsection 1A, which requires the child support agency to pay the cost of initial genetic testing in advance. 
It amends Section 71 to provide that the petitioner must give notice of a proceeding to adjudicate parentage to certain persons if the person's whereabouts are known. And finally, it amends Section 88, Subsection 4 to exclude the Child Support Agency concerning the bill for genetic testing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any questions? Not seeing any questions. I will entertain a motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 371. Motion. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Assemblywoman Newby. Members, any additional comments? Okay, with that, I'll take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, so we have Assemblywoman Hansen, Assemblywoman Gallant, Assemblyman Urich, Assemblyman Gray, and Assemblywoman Hardy as our nays. With that, the motion passes, and I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you. You're welcome. Assembly Bill 373 revises provisions relating to deceptive trade practices directed toward elderly persons. Sponsored by Assemblywoman Gorlow and Herden Committee on March 27th. There's two proposed amendments to the bill. The first amendment is sponsored by Teresa Benitez Thompson from the Office of the Attorney General. She proposed adding a new section to the bill amending NRS 598.0963 to clarify the authority of the Attorney General to seek civil penalties for violations of Chapter 598. And it amends Section 2, Subsection 2 to increase the amount of the civil penalty that the Attorney General may seek up to 15000 from 5000 for each violation. The Second Amendment is sponsored by the uh, Deputy Public Defenders from both Clark and Washoe. They proposed an amendment to revise the penalties in Section 2, Subsection 4 of the bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. With that, members, any questions? Not seeing that. any questions, I will entertain a motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 373. Motion. I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola. Do we have a second? Second from Assemblywoman Hardy. Members, any additional comments on the motion? Not seeing any. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, and with that, the motion passes unanimously. I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Gorlow. And Ms. Thornton, our last one for today. Thank you, Chair. Assembly Bill 408 revises provisions relating to reckless driving, sponsored by Assemblywoman Brown May, and heard in this committee on March 30th. There's one proposed amendment. Uh, the Chief Deputy Public Defender, John Pirro, uh, and Erica Roth from the Washoe County Public Defender's Office proposed prohibiting an operator from charging any fee or cost for the storage of the motor vehicle until at least 48 hours after the motor vehicle arrives and is registered at the place of storage. And it provides that the owner of the vehicle must pay a hardship tariff pursuant to subsection 7 NRS 706.4477 for the cost of removal and storage of the motor vehicle under certain circumstances. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Members, any questions? Not seeing any questions. Do I have, I'm sorry, not seeing any questions. Do I have a motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 408? I have a motion from Vice Chair Marzola. Do I have a second? Second from Assemblyman Europe. Uric. Uh, members, any comments on the motion? Uh, yes, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like um, uh, there to be some consideration uh, for collecting demographic information on the arrest, at, with, uh, on the citations, to include um, all the general stuff and location of where uh, these are going on so that we can track uh, where these incidences are happening and by by and to whom. Okay, so at this point, and Assemblywoman Brown May is not in the room, so um, at this point, I would encourage you to further that discussion with her. Thank you. Ma Thank you. Any additional comments? Okay, all those in favor of amending uh, and passing Assembly Bill 408, please say aye. Anyone opposed? All right, and with that, the motion passes unanimously. And I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Brown May. And with that, I believe that concludes our work session for today. Thank you, members.
And with that, we will move on to the next item on our agenda. And look, even more chairs are clearing up. See, good. Now everyone gets a seat. Um, with that, we will move on to the next item on our agenda is we have one bill today, Assembly Bill 209. Assembly Bill 209 revises provisions relating to certain providers of health care. We have a number of presenters, Assemblywoman Gonzalez, Jennifer Parks, who is an RN and victim's advocate, president of Empower Nevadans Now, Dorian Myers, um, a medical malpractice victim, Candace Duran, a medical malpractice victim, Christian Morris, and Dylan Shaver. And with that, your bill hearing is officially open. So I will give you a few minutes to um, settle in and then pr please proceed when you're ready. So, Assemblywoman, do you have um, co-presenters on Zoom or in Las Vegas? Or is everyone physically here? So everyone's physically here. So I am going to have you all, obviously there's only cha three chairs there. So um, rotate in and out as necessary. And of course, because we have such a number of presenters, please make sure that everyone states their name and spells it for the record. And then after that, you don't have to spell your name every time for the record, but because there are so many presenters, um, please state your name each time you begin to speak so that we have it accurate who is saying what. Thank you so much. Um, so the order is going to go me, Jennifer, the victims, and then we'll have um, Christian for questions, if that's OK. OK, great. All right. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Cecilia Gonzalez, and I'm here to ask for your support for Assembly Bill 209. Um, today is not different from any other day when I'm in judiciary asking and talking about justice. Um, Assembly Bill 209 aims to repeal a 20-year-old set of special protections voters gave to the medical industry. These special rules were passed as a result of a story that the industry told us. Their campaign went like this. These special protections are going to improve health care. They're going to draw in more doctors to Nevada and keeping the ones that we currently have. And they're going to lower the malpractice rates. However, here we are 20 years later, and this is what we know. Our care is worse. We rank 50th in doctors per capita in the entire country. And insurance companies' rates and profits continue to go up year after year. In creating these protections, we gave up our rights. We gave up the power of juries to do what's right in negligent cases. We gave up the time we have to discover and take action and recover damages caused by an unaccountable industry. And we shamefully put a cap on the value of human life. You know, when I took on this project, I didn't really know the history of these laws and to the extent that this issue faces so many Nevadans. Uh, since then, I've had the opportunity to hear from victims from all over the state. Um, you know, I've met a nurse whose hospital's repeated errors left a newborn family without their mother. I met a woman who was given an unnecessary hysterectomy that left her in so much pain that she can no longer have intimate moments with her partner. And I've met another victim whose hospital misdiagnosed her cancer not once, not twice, but three different times, so much so that the doctor had to send um, her sample to outside um, second opinions, causing to put her life in even more jeopardy. And because of these outdated laws, none of these victims have had access, and none of these people held responsible have been held accountable. You know, 
in talking with all of these victims, there are things that are very unique, right? Every person's case is unique to themselves. However, they've all had the same story. Um, and I'm gonna go into the problems, right? Number one, the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations to bring on a medical malpractice case is just one year. One year. You have one year from the loss of a loved one, let's say for example, um, losing your child, to decide if you wanna put your family and yourself through a long, expensive, and grueling trial. This is just far too short. Number two, the delays. Once a victim has decided to seek justice for their poor treatment, providers typically rely on delay tactics, meaning that they hide information from their victims, they claim that records do not exist or have been lost, and provide incomplete information when they finally do provide information. Number three, the affidavit of merit. So for those of you that may not know how to proceed with a mental mal malpractice case or maybe haven't been a part of one, you first have to file what's called or referred to as the affidavit of merit, um, which means that you have to go to another provider who will agree um, or state that you've received what's referred to as below the standard of care, meaning that this doctor has to go on the record against his peer to say um, that you have been hurt, right? So this, again, prolongs the time that you have to find said doctor. Um, and you also have to pay that doctor. And of course, what I feel like we've all been talking about for the last couple months um, is the caps on non-economic damages, um, which are a huge significant barrier to victims seeking justice when we talk about medical malpractice cases. They also tragically define the value of human life as economic productivity and nothing more. If a careless mistake renders a person infertile who's wanted to have a family their entire life, there are no economic damages. If young parents lose a newborn at a hospital, there are no economic damages. If you're caring for an elderly parent who receives negligent health care, there are no economic damages. AB 209 seeks to eliminate these special legal protections that were sold to us 20 years ago for which we are still waiting results. In doing so, Nevada would join, join 24 other states that have no medical malpractice caps. You know, you're gonna hear from the opposition. Nevada's low on doctors, and this is true. I don't think any of us are insensitive to that fact. However, in these 24 states that have no medical malpractice camps, each one of those states still have more doctors per capita than Nevada. You're also gonna hear from the insurance companies who I'm um, gonna go out on a whim here and say they probably hate this bill as well, but in Nevada, malpractice insurance is a source of significant profit for this industry. Into the, um, sorry, excuse me. Since 2007, insurance companies have billed Nevada's doctors for an average of $82 million per year, while only paying out about 24 million in claims. So what does that mean? That means that there's more than 1.1 billion, with a B, dollars against payouts, pocketing three quarters of a billion dollars for themselves. And while those stat stats certainly work in our favor here at the table and unravel a lot of the misleading information on this topic, um, this bill is about accountability. Nevadans do not have to choose between bad care or no care, which is what they will also come up here and tell you. Um, you know, we know that the system is broken. We know that we want to fix it. And this is my contribution to that effort. I believe that this bill finally creates accountability for providing bad care and gives victims and their families the route to hold people accountable for something other than their future treatment or value of economic value. You know, since I've served in this body, we've had a lot of conversations about accountability. We've talked about police being accountable in their communities. We've talked about minors being accountable for the environment. We've even talked about teachers being accountable for student achievement. And today we are here to talk about holding an industry that is dominated by massive corporations accountable for the very people whose health they hold in their hands. Um, Madam Chair, with me today, as you've stated, is Jennifer Parks, the president of Empower Nevadans Now and a registered nurse to talk to you about her real world experience with medical malpractice. We will also hear from a few victims who are strong and courageous to come before you today to tell their stories. And we finally have Christian Morris, an attorney with unmatched experience in this field, available to answer any questions. And at this time, I will turn it over to Jennifer Parks. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. 
Good morning. My name is Jennifer Parks, spelled J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-P-A-R-K-S. I have been a registered nurse for a long time. It'll be 20 years in June. And I've lived in Nevada for 26 years. I'm very proud to call it my home. I am president of Empower Nevadans Now, and I'm honored to serve. This is a group that we formed to focus conversations around the victims of a healthcare industry that's grown unaccountable to its patients and to the quality of care delivered to those patients. Our, her our current healthcare system is a mess. I wish I could say differently. This is partly because the system is set up for profit as opposed to healing the patients. This includes insurance companies. They deny care or require the providers to practice in a certain manner that is not in the patient's best interest. It also includes hospitals that don't give the nurses and doctors the support that they need and instead intentionally understaff the facilities. The issue we have at hand today is not just about simple mistakes or one provider's poor decisions on any one given day, but those happen sometimes. Rather, this is about a more collective problem. And I'm here to tell you that doctors and nurses are caring people. They went into healthcare to help others. But every day, they're forced to provide that care in a substandard fashion. And substandard care is unsafe care. I've lived it from very early on in my career. One night when I was a brand new nurse, I was given an especially unsafe assignment. I had worked short staff before that wasn't new, but this night was different. It was so much so that I was compelled to call the nursing supervisor. I needed to report the unsafe assignment. What you may not know is once you accept report, you cannot leave. That's patient abandonment and it is not okay. So I was tied to that assignment, but I needed it to go on record for how unsafe it was. I asked for additional help and I was denied. Instead, I was told I should do my best. Possible solutions would have been calling in another nurse to help. We have float nurses. Calling in a nursing assistant to offer care. But instead, my hospital gambled with patient safety to save a few bucks on staffing. I was lucky that night. None of my patients died. What a terrible measure. I'm here to tell you that I did provide substandard care that night, and it wasn't safe care. Over the past 20 years, I've been witness to many other examples. I'm gonna highlight just a couple. I've dealt with doctors who were in a hurry to get their patients up to the OR. I'm sure they felt the pressure of the facility as well. So much in a hurry that they didn't come down to the ER to properly consent their patient for the surgery they were about to undergo. I've seen new nurses that were hired into high acuity areas. These are new graduate nurses, some of them without even prior medical experience. Those high acuity areas, they're taking care of some of the sickest of the sick. They weren't given enough training, and in more than one instance, they committed a medication error patient. But that's not enough. They didn't notify the doctor of these abnormal and highly concerning um, readings. And in one case, the patient, a few hours later, coded and died. They missed their chance to intervene. So what is a solution? Identifying a broken system is not enough by itself. We need to give patients a voice and a path to justice. Hospitals and insurance companies are focused on their profits, period. They don't respond when even one of their own staff or multiple staff members alert them to issues of safety and broken parts of the system. They respond only to money. The goal of AB 209 is to do what our laws and regulations and even the state medical board cannot. Hold a system accountable for the quality of care. Only then will they make the necessary changes to protect patients. Our loved ones, our family members, you, me. 
Some of those victims I highlighted just moments ago are not able to come and speak to us. They're no longer alive. But I do have with me today a small group of some brave victims who are willing to share their story. You're going to hear from Dorianne Myers, Candace Duran, and Nova Coffrin. Thank you so much. My name is Dorianne Myers, D-O-R-I-A-N-N-M-Y-E-R-S. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. I want to thank each of you for giving me the time today to share my story. Um, I'm 61 years old and am married to my college sweetheart, Brad. We have two kids, Tyler and Mason. I lived, worked, and raised my family for over 30 years in the state of Nevada. The part of my story that I'm about to share with you started in 2014. My youngest son, Mason, was 15, and my oldest son, Tyler, you are in the meeting now, <laughs> was 18. My son, Tyler, was born with a degenerative muscle disorder. When he turned five years old, I gave up my career in real estate, and I became a stay-at-home mom to care for him full-time. By the time he was 10 years old, he was confined to a power wheelchair. In 2014, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was told that it was caught very early and that a lumpectomy was all that was necessary. I was so grateful for early detection. A medical marker clip was placed in the tumor and the surgery was then performed. After that, I believed that I was cancer free. The next year, I went in for my annual mammogram, and once again, there was a suspicious spot in the exact same area. Another biopsy was performed, and a new medical marker clip was placed. The results showed breast cancer. I couldn't believe that I was facing cancer a second time. I went through chemotherapy, and then I had a double mastectomy so that I would never have to go through this again. Just a few months after that surgery, I discovered for a third time that a mass still existed in the same breast in the same location. Chemotherapy had to begin immediately. I couldn't believe that cancer could still be there. At this point, my husband Brad and I decided that we needed to seek medical care elsewhere. We called Nevada our home for 30 years, but sadly, we discovered that when we needed our medical community the most, um, they weren't there for us to help me survive cancer. So we went to Texas and went to a renowned cancer center in Texas. And during some imaging tests that I had while I was there, it was discovered that the tumor in my breast still had a medical marker clip in it. What does this mean? It means that the cancerous tumor had never been removed during a double mastectomy. It had been left behind. I was devastated. I had been through an aggressive chemotherapy treatment that wasn't even necessary because my cancer had not reoccurred. It had never been removed. I lived away from my family for months on end. Two months after I returned from Texas, I became ill and was soon diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. I once again left Nevada and sought medical care in Texas. My leukemia was deemed to be caused by one of the unnecessary chemotherapies that was given to me in Nevada. I was hospitalized for nine months while trying to fight for my life. Now as traumatic as all of this sounds, I will now share with you 
the most devastating part of my story. During my time in Texas, my oldest son, Tyler, began to succumb to his disease, and he passed away at the age of 21 while I was going through treatments. I had given up so much to care for him, yet I wasn't able to be with him and care for him during the last two years of his life. I can't even find the words to express the heartache that this mama experienced. What happened with my medical care should never have happened. I no longer am the wife and the mother that I wanted to be because of my medical conditions. Although I cannot change what has happened to me in the past, I can use this experience to help others. So today, I come before you and I share my story to encourage you to help pave a path for justice for all the families in the state of Nevada. Thank you for your time, for letting me share my story. Hello, my name is Candice Duran, C-A-N-D-I-C-E-D-U-R-E-N. Bear with me, I'm a little nervous, really nervous today. I'm just going to give you guys my story. So <clears throat> thank you so much for having me, and thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. My name is Candice Duran. I'm a 33-year-old proud mother of four sons, Elijah, Kavaya, Kaimani, and Ezra. And I'm here today because I've been put in a position of being a 33-year-old mother that does not get to live the life of a usual 33-year-old mother due to medical malpractice. And I've never been able to get justice for what happened to me. And that is why I'm testifying because I don't ever want anybody else to have to go through what I have gone through and be put in the position I'm in today. So hear my story. In 2016, I was pregnant with my fourth son and I was having way more complications than I ever did with my first three. I knew something was wrong because of the horrible pain I was experiencing and obvious symptoms because my skin was even busting open from the water retention that I was having. But every time I went to the doctor, I told him something was very wrong. He continued to downplay my concerns and told me that despite what I felt, it was all normal. He kept telling me that I had a urinary tract infection because I had protein spilling into my urine. So he was trying to treat it with antibiotics, which was unsuccessful. So he then started giving me injections of antibiotics along with oral antibiotics at the same time. After so long of doing all of this and nothing working, he told me he didn't want to deal with me anymore. I ended up in the ER. And when I was admitted, they tracked down the medical records from my doctor, and from looking at all the notes, they indicated he knew that I had preeclampsia this whole time. But I was pretty lucky because failure to diagnose preeclampsia can put the mother in a coma or sometimes lose the life of the mother and the child. My doctor kept me in this high-risk state that caused a whole domino effect of health issues. Although my son is healthy and I'm alive, my path has not been easy at all. After my son was born, um, the preeclampsia did not go away, and my kidneys were not functioning. So then I had to be put in ICU, and my son had to go home without me. A kidney bi biopsy showed that lupus was causing kidney failure, which I never had an issue with because I found out that I had lupus, but it was always in a dormant state because uh, all the stress on, the, on my body from the preeclampsia caused my lupus to come out of dormancy and start attacking my kidneys. I had to go through chemotherapy just to stop the lupus from doing any more damage. I was in and out of the hospital for the next year dealing with my new list of medical conditions. And by the time I was able to get out of the hospital and start trying to do anything to get any justice, I had learned it was already too late, but now I am stuck with end-stage kidney failure for the rest of my life. Today, my kidneys only function at about 3%. I have to undergo dialysis every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 
I don't get to be the kind of mom that I want to be. And I don't get to give my sons the kind of life that I planned on giving them. I worry every day that I might not get to see them grow up or witness any of the key milestones that every parent dreams about being a part of. And I will never get this time back with them. There are no economic damages under Nevada law for what I have lost and what I will never get back. So thank you for hearing my story. And that's all I have. <laughs>
In addition to CPR, they also conveniently gave me a dose of Narcan, which qu quickly brought me back once several minutes of CPR had effectively gotten my heart to start beating again. I remember coming to and my husband crying next to me trying to explain what happened. Well, I missed my son's birthday that year. I was sent to ICU for several days. They performed every test under the sun, EEGs for brain activity, CAT scans, MRIs of my heart and brain, my entire body. I was healthy. It was only after that I was about to be discharged from the hospital that, that I learned that they never even called my on-call doctor from my neurosurgeon or my, neuro, my neurosurgeon. He was livid. He told me he would have suggested a totally different course of action that would likely have not resulted and ended in cardiac death. The coming weeks were a lot for me to process. On one hand, I felt lucky to have survived when the American Medical Association statistics show that only 25% of people survive cardiac arrest in a hospital setting. The odds are much lower outside of a hospital. However, it would have never happened to me outside of a hospital setting because it was the hospital that overdosed me to the point of cardiac death within 45 minutes of arriving into the emergency room. Then to add insult to injury, I received a hefty bill for the ICU stay. I called the hospital multiple times, I wrote letters, I sent them to everyone I could find in a position of authority at the hospital and received no responses from anyone. No apologies, no promises to amend their policies or procedures so that this didn't happen to anyone else, nothing. I can't tell you how disheartening it was uh, to go through that whole situation. I was gaslit by the hospital who told me I just had a low tolerance for pain meds. I called several attorneys and no one would touch the case. They said I was alive and well and that was my consolation. It wasn't worth it to go up against these giant hospital organizations that dedicate millions and millions of dollars to make stories like mine go away. My medical notes had several inconsistencies, but clear as day, at the top it said cardiac arrest, cause unspecified. Then they proceeded to notate that I was given chest compressions followed by Narcan, which we all know what that's for. That resulted in the favorable outcome. Since my release, I haven't been the same, both physically and emotionally. I have ongoing pain that should be totally gone, according to my neurosurgeon. My symptoms before I went in for surgery were treated, but then I came out of the ER with new symptoms. My only choice is to move forward and not dwell in anger and the what ifs. But then I keep hearing stories like the ones you heard before me. They happen a lot. I hear stories of mothers who didn't make it home. I hear stories of people who were permanently maimed to the point that they aren't the same person anymore. Sometimes I feel guilty I survived with so little damage in comparison. In our most vulnerable moments, we have been betrayed. There must be some accountability. What's happened to me cannot be changed. I want what happened to me and everyone else here today to never happen to anyone else. I don't want to hear another story of a mama not being able to care for her children the way they deserve because of medical negligence. I lived and I'm relatively healthy, but it easily could have been a very different outcome. Why did I make it and others didn't? My own 33-year-old cousin died last year in his hospital room after he aspirated and no one was able to come and help him. The outcomes of these stories all vary, but the reality is that none of them should ever have happened. Some people walk away with luck on their side. Some people never go home. Others never go home the same. None of it is their fault. We must have- 209, which obviously is a bill that was in 2002 and kind of revamped in 2004 is the focus of what we're talking about. I just want to say that it was a privilege to be able to sit up here with these witnesses and hear their story because it is incredibly powerful and we are all here to improve healthcare in Nevada. And addressing AB 209 is a step toward that goal. Because the reality is, is that the fear of reprimand and accountability is what keeps quality high. And we deserve to demand that here in Nevada. We should be able to demand quality health care. And one of the ways we can do that is by ensuring that we are watching what our medical providers are doing and keeping it in check. It's checks and balances like we have in every single profession. So looking at AB 209, the changes to it are really not anything that have any uh, big kind of consequence. We've got a section here about having uh, health, uh, having insurance. Generally, doctors already have insurance, one million, three million. It's required if you want to have hospital privileges. It's required if you have an ambulatory surgical center. There are a few that don't. I mean, they can quite go bare, but it just requires that they actually have health insurance. I think we all kind of assume or 
liability insurance. I think we all kind of assume that they do anyways, but this would put that requirement in there. Then we're looking at the repealed section. I really do think this is the area of focus. So as we know, the current status of our law in Nevada has a limitation on the value of human life. And the repealed section would take off that limitation to the value of human life and of human loss. It also would repeal the kind of joint and several liability issues that we have, where when we work as doctors, kind of like we work in any profession, we're a system. And so we have to look at the medical records that come from other providers, rely on that information, make sure that we have the full picture when we're taking care of a patient. And it takes away that area where it's like, well, each doctor can point at the other doctor to say, it wasn't my fault, it was yours. Everyone is joint and severally liable. It also repeals the area of a one-year statute of limitations. The reason why that is important is because there are many times where people aren't capable of knowing what has happened to them. They are currently suffering from a medical condition. They're not focused on, oh, what went wrong? They're trying to live, they're trying to survive, they're trying to get better. In addition, medical care is complex. And so for me, one of the few attorneys that does still take medical malpractice cases, and they, we are few and far between, you get tens of thousands of pages of medical records. And you've got to dig through them to figure out what is in them. And many times there's omitted information. Many times there's information that is not complete. And it is very difficult to get a picture and be able to say, hey, what happened in this case in this very short period of one year? So that's a very important part of the repealed sections for this AB 209. There are some areas that are very kind of basic and straightforward. Many cases go to a settlement conference. That's something that happens in almost every single litigation case, as you will at some point go to a settlement conference. But that's another portion here for uh, the repealed. And then the other one would be that the dismissal of the action without the affidavit of a medical expert. I mean, something that is very difficult for the litigation of these cases is to figure out what went wrong when you're not allowed to do any discovery. You're not allowed to talk to the medical provider. You're not allowed to take depositions. You're not allowed to get the real evidence before you file the case. You can only rely on kind of what you can see in the medical records that they're willing to give you. And so many times it's very difficult to be able to dig in and see what's going on in these cases before you file the lawsuit. Yet the law requires that you find an expert generally in another state to look at these and say, okay, we think something's gone wrong here and it's fallen below the standard of care that allows you to even get access to justice. And so the idea here is to not lock patients out of the courthouse, not lock the citizens of Nevada out of the courthouse. Allow them to have their day. Allow them to have the justice that almost half of the states are allowing this to happen. And the reason why it's important is because transparency, accountability, and responsibility breeds quality. And we know it. And that's why we're talking about these issues. Because when you have transparency, responsibility, and accountability, you will attract good doctors. We want good doctors in Nevada. Good doctors don't consider, well, is there a cap before they come to practice in a state? Good doctors who actually care for their patients aren't the ones focused on this. And the reality is, is that these caps have benefited one entity, and that would be insurance companies. And it's been going on for many, many years, which is why this bill is so important, and I appreciate the time to be here. And I will uh, welcome any questions or comments from anyone here. Thank you for your presentation for everyone. And thank you especially to the victims who have been so brave to come forward and share your stories in a, in a public setting like this. We appreciate that. Um, with that, your presentation has concluded and you are ready for questions? Yes. Okay. All right, then we will begin. Our first question is from Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for this bill <coughs> presentation. Um, section 4, the additional um, language in Section 1 regarding the um, liability policy that needs to be um, held, and it applies then to Section 2, which refers to NRS 41A.017, Provider of Health Care. Looking up that statute, I mean, it's that statute includes folks that are 
far beyond just physicians, um, surgeons, like some of the ones that we talked about today. Uh, do those, uh, like physical therapists, psychologists, those sorts of folks, do they currently have to carry the uh, liability policy right now, or would this be a change that they would need to now start carrying that? That's a very good question, Assemblywoman. Thank you for that. And I think that that is a very expansive category that I think needs to be looked at and parceled out. For someone who isn't in um, their profession, I can't tell you specifically who is required to and who is not required to. Generally, when you have a license and you renew it, you have to prove to uh, an entity, the state, an insurance company, that you do have liability insurance of some level. So I think that that's a very good point to make that this blanket for everyone who falls within that category would have to have this type of level of coverage needs to be looked at. I can't specifically answer as to whether they currently are required to do so for each specific category, but I do, many people do, in order to have an insurance contract, to have a, a, a payer insurance even use you, you have to prove that you have some level of liability insurance, but does it currently have law that every single person has to have that level? Not currently, and I think that has to be something that's carefully looked at as to each category and the requirements per that. Thank you for that. And can I just have you uh, restate your name for the record again? I apologize, Christian Morris. Thank you so much. And so is it also just for the sake of record keeping, you'll be responding to all the questions along with Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Yes, I will, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to say, you know, my heart goes out to everybody's story. Um, my sister lost her husband actually to medical mal. Um, that being said, I mean, this is still a very, very tricky issue, especially here in Nevada. Has the Nevada Supreme Court ruled on the cap or the constitutionality on the cap of non-economic damages in Nevada? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, this is an issue that has, it's, it's under the law, and they do have to, of course, figure out when the cap applies, and it gets reduced down generally by the district court judges when there is a, a verdict that comes in. So I don't know if you're aware of this, jurors don't get to know about this cap. So when jurors hear a case and they see the epic level of agony and pain and they want to compensate for what has happened for the loss of a wife, for the loss of a husband, for the loss of a child, they do not know that they are not actually able to do that. That's something that's done by the district court judge after the verdict comes down and it is reduced down. So they follow the law. So generally the judges just take what we have as non-economic versus economic. And just for everyone's clarity, you know, non-economic is the value of disfigurement, the value of the loss of not having your wife, the value of the loss of the enjoyment of life. It is limited to $350,000. So to answer the question specifically on has the Supreme Court decided it, to my knowledge, no, because they've always just followed the law and not litigated the constitutionality of it. Uh, thank you. Our next question is from Assemblyman Yurick. Thank you, Chair. And thanks for uh, coming in and presenting, and, and truly our hearts go out to the co-presenters that share their stories. Um, it's difficult to hear those. Um, and there's another story, right, as well here, and I think that's the tension in the room. Um, and I remember, for example, to set up my question, um, my wife was pregnant with our first child back when I was 25 years old, uh, a, a new, relatively new police officer, had insurance, looking forward to giving birth to our child when the crisis back then occurred and insurance companies were pulling out and there was grave concern in the OBGYN area in particular where my wife and I were looking, are we even going to have a doctor here to help give birth to our child? So that created quite a scare in us. Um, and so I know special sessions went on. Uh, I had a couple of kids later and OBGYNs were still here. So I, I guess my question is, did the, did the current law and the cap that we have, did it help to stabilize in the decisions that were made in special session and the law that it exists now, did it help to stabilize the insurance market? And if so, are we, should we be concerned that this type of repeal, could it result in increased insurance rates again that could then lead to doctors pulling out and exacerbating our health care crisis? So thank you very much for that question, Christian Morris. Um, 
I think that we have to really look at why we're in the situation that we are. Because what happened to kind of lead to the law that we have currently in Nevada is that a very large insurance company, St. Paul, pulled out of Nevada. Doctors didn't leave Nevada. A large insurance company, for reasons that are not disclosed, pulled out of Nevada. And so there was a need to make sure that there were liability insurers here in Nevada. Has it stabilized is a great question because if you tell an insurance company, hey, you can bill all of our doctors their premiums and we're going to limit what you pay out, yes, that absolutely will do it. But the issue is, is that is there truly doctors leaving Nevada because they don't have liability insurance? The issue was an insurance company did. And there are no insurance companies that are in crisis here in, in relation to giving liability insurance to doctors. There isn't some sort of shortage of insurance companies. And I think that's the reality of what we need to look at. Because was it truly the issue of doctors leaving Nevada, or did one insurance company pull out in 2002 and then a crisis happened and insurance companies have come in? Insurance companies insure doctors in every single state in our nation. That's what they do, and these doctors come and they practice here. Do we need good doctors in Nevada? Do we need more medical providers in Nevada? Yes. But to say and come here and it's a, a free-for-all, and no matter what you do, if you kill someone, the value is $350,000 is not the right message. And it hasn't been helping us. We haven't been just able to recruit more of them because of that. And I think that's what we need to look at, is what is the effect? Because the effect isn't that doctors are running away or that doctors are coming. We are still struggling to get them into our state. We need to provide a good environment for them to be here. We want Nevada to be an attractive place to practice and to live. But we want good doctors coming in to do that. And by raising limitations, by reducing this limitation, by taking it away, the message is, well, just practice, not good practice. And it hasn't been proven. There aren't statistics that I'm aware of that says, well, the, the more reduced your cap is, the better doctors you get and the more you get. And so we have to look at what was the reason why we're here. And the reason why we're here isn't because doctors were leaving. It's because of the fact that there was an insurance issue that, for whatever reason, pulled out and insured like 60% of the doctors. And plenty of insurance companies have filled that issue. And has it stabilized? Sure. But who has suffered is the patients who has suffered as the citizens of Nevada by getting quality medical care. Because the reality is, is that we do need checks and balances, and fear of reprimand is real. Nobody wants to get sued. So what do you do? You make sure that you don't do anything to the best of your ability to allow that to happen. And you give quality care. And so what happened, which kind of led to where we are, really wasn't truly about no one wanted to move to Nevada because we didn't have this law in place. It was an issue with an insurance company, and it certainly has stabilized. And the information you found is that the insurance companies have benefited billions by allowing that to happen. And who has suffered is the citizens. And that's the reality of what we're sitting here looking at today. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Assemblyman Orrin Licker. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, as your witnesses and testimony have indicated, having this $350,000 cap can be very unfair. And as the Florida Supreme Court said, it can be irrational when you compensate the people with lower injuries and not compensate the people with the more serious injuries, um, which is surprising that our Supreme Court didn't think it was irrational to have the cap, but, but my question is, if you remove the cap entirely and remove this arbitrary system we have now, because it is arbitrary, we end up with another arbit uh, some arbitrariness on the other side. Because one of the downsides of non-economic damages is juries don't really have any guidance. It's, it's very subjective and uh, unlike economic damages where they have to measure in certain ways what are your medical costs, what are your lost wages, at least there's some metric. But there's no real metric. And so that can lead juries to, to act in inconsistent, arbitrary on their own. Of course, judges can step in, but judges can be arbitrary too. So what is your answer for the removing one arbitrariness on one side and just replacing it with, on a, the other side? 
Thank you, Assemblyman. Christian Morris. I think your concern is something that is addressed by every single citizen in Nevada, and that is the beauty of the jury system. Who is better to value human loss and human life than another human? Because that is where it isn't actually arbitrary. It is based on how other humans value humanity and value the pain and anguish and loss that they see because it's happened to someone in their community. They are, in fact, the best measure for these damages because who else is supposed to do it? Who else is the best person to do it? And that's why the jury system is so beautiful and access to justice is essential. In my opinion, that is how we truly get the temperature of what is going on in our community. When the jury speaks, and when they speak, it's based on what they have seen in a courtroom, which many people think is, you know, very sterile. It's not. It's where epic loss is measured. And it's measured by people who are wholly able to do it because they are humans who can relate, who can see, and can value it. And it's not really arbitrary if you think about it. It is a group of people that come together using their common sense, using the evidence that they have seen, using their intuition to say this is how this life and this loss and this injury should be valued. And I honor their decisions in that. And there's so many things that we can hear, runaway jury, hot coffee case. And when you truly look at why humans in our community come together in a courtroom and make a decision, it is eye-opening as to how valid that is and why it isn't actually arbitrary and the, the law that we're looking at today kind of is. It's a number that was picked and it has nothing to do with the actual pain that you even heard here today. And that's where it is so essential that every person have that opportunity to be valued by people in their community who can relate, who can understand, and who can hear the whole story and be able to come to evaluation based on that. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I wanted to add. Um, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. Um, doctor, you mentioned that these cases are subjective, and I think that they should be. And I think, um, you know, my Miss um, Morris commented on that part, right, is that these victims and families have no path forward or justice forward other than an industry who came here in Nevada and set this arbitrary number. Um, and so... In, in your response, I just think it should be subjective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for presenting today. And, and thank you to those victims that came forward. I know it's not easy to relive your trauma and to tell your story, and I appreciate you doing that. Um, I also have uh, an example of medical malpractice in my experience. I think most of us do. I took my two-year-old daughter to a local Washoe hospital where they wrote down her weight as 35 kilograms instead of 35 pounds and then dosed her accordingly. And I think all the medical experts in this room, uh, their eyes are getting big right now because they, they know how serious that is. So from that experience, though, I don't know that getting a million dollars after she died would have fixed that for me. Right. And she didn't. She's still alive and well. But had she died, I don't know that any amount of money would have fixed that. And so what I want to look at is prevention. How do we stop these from happening before we get there? And I think Ms. Parks mentioned that there are issues with insurance companies and for profit hospitals and staffing. And I just want to know how this bill gets those fixes, not necessarily gets me money after something wrong happens. And, and I just to add some context, as a teacher, there are many teachers that are increasingly being sued for violating IEPs. It's become an industry. And that has not made our districts given me more support in my classroom. It has not made my district Assembly give me a smaller woman. class size. Sorry, sorry. Um, I will stick to a question. So I just want to know, comparably, right, how will this make the hospitals actually fix the staffing issues and the other things by suing doctors? That's my question. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris. I think that it is a very good question because I think that's what a lot of people wonder. What will ever make it better? And no amount of money will ever make it better. 
But the reality is, is that when there are consequences, it deters bad action. And that's what it is, it's deterrence. Because if there are consequences when things happen, such as a grave mistake in the weight of a baby, which could have incredibly bad outcomes, will people be more careful in making sure that there's proper staffing, that there's proper training, that they have all of the policies and procedures in place, that there's supervision? Because why? Kind of like I said before, people don't want to be sued. But the message is, is that please stay in check. Please take care of us in our most important moment or there are consequences. And that is a reality, is that in human nature, that is what keeps people kind of doing everything that we should do. We can't just hope. They have to have that consequence. And kind of like Jennifer Park said, they, of course they look at the bottom line. And so if you put that bottom line at issue, there will be actions. And that is what we want to do. It is to compensate, yes, right? Because there has to be some sort of justice. But the other most important part of justice is deterrence of bad actions. And we want good doctors, we want good hospitals, we want good medical providers. And that's the message that we want to send. And by deterring bad action, the result is good action. Thank you. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair. And I too want to um, express my uh, empathy for those victims that shared their stories and to being vulnerable and going back and reliving those experiences. Um, so my question, um, you know, we've heard a, a lot of talk this session and in previous sessions about we need more doctors here, we need more healthcare providers, you know, we want, we have our medical schools, we want to try and keep those students here in Nevada. Um, so my question kind of is, um, you know, that's part of our strategy, homegrown doctors and having them here in Nevada. So my question is, you know, our current medical students, this bill creates risk for them. It creates uncertain costs, um, conditions, and things like that. How are those students prepared for that and wanting to stay here in Nevada? So, you know, do we have any kind of idea how it's going to affect those students that we're trying to keep here? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris. I think that it's a very legitimate concern. I think that one of the most important things is we have to look at what is the mindset behind it. Uh, my husband is a doctor. Uh, I know a lot of people in the medical community. And um, I am not aware of anyone who says, I'm going to leave the state of Nevada based on our law or I'm going to stay in the state of Nevada based on this law regarding the caps. I don't know of any of that. I don't know of any doctor even personally who's left the state of Nevada before 2002 and then decided to move here after the law changed. But I think the issue is, is that what is the concern is that they, that they won't have a limitation on it, that their, their malpractice rates will go up. Well, why limit the citizens of Nevada from their access to justice and just allow the insurance companies to charge whatever they would like. Imagine if we had to cap them on, on the amount that they could charge a doctor in their premiums. That would be pretty powerful. But they've, they can offer a rebate to their policyholders. They have been able to more than stabilize. They could have this ability to say, hey, you know, we want to stay as an insurance company here in Nevada. We're not going to charge excessive rates. I obviously have no say in the insurance industry, but what I can say is that we want good doctors here. We want homegrown doctors, but the message shouldn't be stay here because we're gonna limit your exposure. The message should be stay here and give good quality care to our citizens. And that should be the message that we have here because you know there are many states that have many great doctors that do not have the type of limitation on the value of human life and loss that we do here. And so if there was a correlation, I would love to speak to it. But I think the message has to be clear. We love you. We want you to stay here. We want good care. And I think a law saying, well, you know, just bad care is OK, too, is a dangerous message to send. And we want people to come out of medical school, stay here, and give us good quality care. And I think this isn't a message that is opposite of that. I think if you want a higher standard, you have to ask for it. And that's what this does. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just so that I know there's a lot of people in the room that 
have are waiting for their opportunity to give testimony, but we do have a lot of questions. So I want to make sure that um, members have the opportunity to ask those questions. Again, we have plenty of time right now, so just kind of giving everyone just just a little touch point where we're at. We still have quite a few questions to go through. Okay, so so please, I I, I appreciate that you understand that and um, that of course there'd be a lot of questions today. With that, our next question is from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you, Chair. And it's good to see you, Ms. Morris. Um, I've had an op can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, I've had an opportunity to work with you and I know you're quite passionate about this issue. Um, and so thank you for being here and you know, being an advocate. It's deeply personal for me. I, I'm pretty open in this building that my husband was in a coma and almost died and um, had amazing doctors and literally he survived and he's better than ever. So I have the opposite story and I'm so happy I do. But say that didn't happen, right? And it went terribly wrong and they didn't listen to me and da 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 and the statute of limitations I totally get one year you're like not you're still dealing with grief you know um, that year even when my husband made it I was still in shock and odd you know you're in that I get a year is crazy but that like shouldn't there be some sort of limitation I mean could a could a baby who you know had was circumcised and then at 40 decides that that was a horrible thing to do and sue the doctor when he's 40. I mean, I just feel like there needs to be some sort of limitation. So if you want to take that. Yeah, thank you, Assemblywoman uh, Christian Morris. There has to be absolutely some sort of standard, right? And what it is is it's falling below the standard of care. And the standard of care is something that is established by the medical community and the care that is given. So it is not as if, you know, in your example, would it be a feasible case that that child be able to sue 40 years later? No, it would not, because the doctor followed the parent's wishes and circumcised the child at their request. There has to be viability in the claims that are made. And the reality is, is that in order to, and this is not something like, oh, everyone just loves to sue a doctor. I don't want to have to sue a doctor. It's usually because some horrid tragedy happened and it needs to be held accountable, and that's it. But you have a defendant who has obviously credibility, they obviously have very good education. This is not something where every claim is just going to be thrown at it, and I think that that's an illusion that happens. There has to be falling below the standard of care. And for every litigation case, in order to prove that, you've got to have areas of expertise in which they said, this is something that fell below the standard of care. This doctor's conduct rose to the level of gross negligence. And that's what we're looking at. These are not cases that are um, just easily filed and then they go away. These are litigated cases. These are cases that take a lot of medical expertise. And you have to be able to prove it in a court of law with the standards. And so I think that concern is not one that could actually come to fruition when you look at what it actually takes, because all of us have standards. In the legal profession, I would have to do something that fell below my standard of care that I give to my clients, not for every move that I make. And I think that that's something that needs to be really addressed, because I think it's a, it's a fear that a lot of doctors have, and there has to be a standard of care shown to have been breached. I know I'm not allowed to follow up. Um, so, Sally no, Gonzalez, District 16, for the record, I just wanted to dovetail off that. You know, we're not asking for an unlimited amount of time. So, even in that example, a person would not be able to come back 40 years later, right? We are asking for general negligence. And I just wanted to touch back on my opening remarks about how we gave this industry special protections that no other industry has, right? So, if I hit you with my car, general negligence, you still have a statute of limitations of two years to bring a case forward. So, we're not asking for, you know, unlimited time or literally asking for it to be treated like any other act of negligence. Thank you. Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for being here uh, to, to take our questions. Uh, there had been um, something mentioned earlier from, from somebody else uh, regarding nurses and that um, 
some, what I want to clarify on the record is nurses, unlike doctors, nurses are covered by the hospital's insurance. Is that correct? They don't have to have their own insurance. If, if I could get that answered, and then I'll ask the rest of my question. Thank you. Christian Morris, yes. Okay, great. So it, it, it sounded like in some of the testimony we heard that the hospitals are, are not hiring enough to keep costs low, to, to not hire enough nurses. And we know there are shortages of doctors, of nurses in, in our state, at our hospitals. So those workloads can be k kind of onerous. But if those nurses are covered by the hospital insurance, isn't it just inherent then that the hospital would be very conscientious about their risk management because of their insurance costs? So it's not that they're trying to hire less. They're going to manage better because they won't need to keep their insurance costs down. So I was just curious if you could um, expand on that a little bit, the hospital's risk management versus their insurance costs and the nurse's. Uh, thank you, Christian Morris. I think that the issue that really needs to be looked at is where is the cause and effect of risk management? Because when a claim is brought against a hospital, let's just say for the negligence of a nurse, who really deals with that? Well, the risk management is involved, but it's really the insurance company that provides the insurance that's handling kind of the adjustment of the claim that's been made. And so it really does always track back to the insurance company. Now, the insurance companies are the ones that kind of handle, quote, the money part. The risk management kind of interfaces with the insurance company. But the reality is, is that the more claims that are brought against the hospital, the more risk management is going to have to deal with that and interface with their insurance company. So when we look at what is going to make deterrence happen, is that if they are truly looking to take down costs, all of that takes time. When a claim is made, risk management has to be involved. They've got to work with their insurance company. They've got to deal with their nurses. All of that takes time away from patient care. And so you always want to make sure that they are looking, the hospital and the risk management, to limit that from occurring. Because the money reality is with the insurance company. And the insurance company is the one who actually writes the checks. But the risk management itself, you want them focused on the quality of care. You want them focused on less claims being made so more time can be spent taking care of the patients. And the way you do that is by supervision, is by policies and procedures in effect, is by watching what's going on in your hospital. So the time can be, and the reality is, is yes, there is short staffing. But if the, if the true reality of this bill was working, we wouldn't have this problem. We wouldn't have the short staffing. We wouldn't have the lack of the doctor. So the cause and effect of the law isn't coming to fruition, which the issue is, is we need to make sure we get better health care and more health care providers. But we want the hospital's risk management to be focused exactly which is on patient care as opposed to trying to take this issue of money, which we really know is truly the insurance company, and focus on the care. So I hope that helps a little bit because risk management in itself is the one that deals with the claims being made, but the behind the scenes is always the insurance company that's dealing with the money aspect of it, not truly the hospital itself. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Gallant. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I feel for a lot of the victims in this system and coming from somebody who chooses to birth her babies at home rather in the hospital because the insurance and the attorneys, that it's based on reducing liabilities, so they want me to fit into a box, and that can cause complications. I understand that. But I do also know that we've had some amazing care here in Nevada, um, and the doctors have been just phenomenal. So, and also as a business owner, I know anybody can sue for anything. And so I know we're talking about these jury cases, but most cases end up being settled and it does have an effect on the insurance and on costs. So my question is, is how many pending med mal cases are there? And then also how many of those med mal cases typically end up being just settled and not making it to the jury? because that still increases costs. It still raises insurance rates. It still raises like my E&O as a business owner, even though I didn't do anything wrong in a particular case. So can you give us that 
whole picture. Yes, thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris. In Clark County, um, there is under 400 medical malpractice cases currently. And to give you some perspective, there are tens of thousands of cases down at the courthouse. There are tens of thousands of procedures happening in Nevada per year. It is truly a handful of cases. And the reality is, is you're correct, most cases settle. However, the, rea the reality also is that when medical malpractice cases go to trial, it is generally a defense verdict. Why? Because people do not want to not trust their doctor. It scares people to not trust their doctor. I know everyone in this room wants to be able to trust their doctor. And the reality is, is that there are actions that happen that force us to not be able to do that. It's taken away from us. And so where the danger is, and I, I fully uh, resonates with me what you're saying, but when you look at the reality of it, this is one of the most important professions that we have. This is the most important time. Wouldn't we want to make sure it's done correctly? And in order to do that, there has to be accountability of it. And if we don't have the accountability, things can run rampant and go bad and tragic stories happen with absolutely no responsibility being held. And that's where you have to kind of juxtapose these two issues that you're kind of talking about. But there are very few medical malpractice cases because so many people just turned them down. The statute ran. It doesn't make sense to do it because Unfortunately, the person died and the value of their life is only 350000 so what are we going to do about that? I mean, these are the realities of looking at the other side of it. And so do we want to make it attractive to sue a doctor? No. What we want to do is make it attractive to practice good medicine. And by making it attractive is that you are careful because we need our medical providers to be careful. And one of the ways to do that and keep them as check is this route. And are there issues of, to be of concern and be talked about? I think that those are absolutely legitimate. But as we sit here now, this is not something that we can actually pursue. We cannot demand good health care through accountability and transparency at the courthouse because our citizens can't get in the courthouse for a majority of the cases and the things that go wrong to them. Thank you. Thank you. Cecilia Gonzalez, for the record, thank you so much for the question. I wanted to jump in here. Um, I'm, I, discussed in my remarks the, the take home of this industry, right? $1.1 billion. So what does that mean in terms of insurance? That means that for every $100 that they collect, they are pocketing $60. And if this was health insurance, that would be against the law. They would have to return it back to you, right? Um, and so um, I, I wanted to point out too that it's risk rated. So just any insurance, for example, if I get in a car accident tomorrow, if I get in a car accident next week, right, the insurance company is going to come back and say, hey, your risk has gone up, my premiums will go up, right? And so in this situation, it's the same with our doctors. If they're having multiple claims, their insurance rate would go up. Um, and so I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this. My question was around the affidavit of merit that was discussed earlier. If you could just talk about what's the average cost, maybe wait time, or do, are there doctors that do it? Just general information about that. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris, in order for us to be able to even file a medical malpractice lawsuit in Nevada, we have to find an expert who is basically in the same field of the area in which the negligence occurred and have them write this affidavit saying that what we saw here falls below the standard of care. These are the actions that I saw. This is the areas in which the, the failure occurred, and we have to attach that to the complaint. Now, this is something that, as someone who practices medical malpractice, I am constantly scrambling for because doctors are busy. Now, there are doctors who review these. I mean, there are in every state you can find different doctors who will look to review them, but it costs around five to $10,000 to get that, and you have to be able to get the medical records to them. There are cases that I've heard that are absolutely tragic. The person has passed, there isn't an estate established, I can't get the medical records, the statute of limitations 
passes and I can't do anything about it. So our ability to even get these affidavits is so difficult because of the fact we've got this one year, we've got to get evidence to this doctor, to this expert to have him review or her review and have them find all of the areas in which there was medical negligence in order for us to even file the complaint. And that's really where a lot of these cases go to the wayside is this really short statute of limitation and this requirement that you have evidence before you have evidence. Because many times I'll request medical records from the hospital, thousands and thousands will come in, but the one thing I'm looking for isn't included. And I don't even have subpoena power at that point to get it because I don't have anything that gives me subpoena power. I can only get the family to request and go in there. And I have family members go in there and stand at the desk and wait and wait and wait for those records. And I'll dig through and find missing or omitted records, which is another part of this bill, which is it will be a fine if you omit or mislead in these medical records, which happens many times. They'll say, oh, we forgot to give that to you. And it's probably the most important part of the case. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation and thank you especially to the victims for coming and sharing your stories. Uh, so your last statement just changed my question because uh, now I do want to go to section one. Can you go through that a little more detail and um, say what has been going on? It, has there Have there been providers of health care that have knowingly made false and misleading statements? Is it just that you're not getting records because there's, because records are difficult to maintain and there's been mismanagement in hospitals or is it literally that there's false information that's being provided? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris. Yes, there are situations in which there have been misleading statements made to the patients as to what the MRI shows that a, a, a wrong disc was operated on, the disc below was operated on, it should have been the disc above, and that information is never told to the patient. I know a specific case of that in which the patient took their MRI to another doctor and the doctor said that's not the level that was operated on. And that is the reality of what we have is that there is a disproportionate in power because doctors have so much knowledge and we trust that they're telling us the truth. And so we want to make sure, I'm not saying all doctors do it, I'm not saying that there is absolutely every situation where I request hospital records there's missing ones, but it does happen. And the reality is, is we just want to make sure it doesn't. Because if you are talking to a patient, you need to be truthful about that. And it's not a huge consequence, I mean, it is a consequence that will probably have some impact if you look at it, that you cannot mislead your patients. And I think that that should be standard. I don't think that it has to be written down, but unfortunately, there are situations in which important medical records are not in the medical packet. There are situations, and I, I know of another one with the nurse that literally misread the chart to the family in fear of you know not wanting to have repercussions for what had happened. And so we wanna make sure that that stops, that it should be. We would say we want that to happen put it in writing, it makes it a little bit more powerful. Be honest with your patients. When they request their records, they're entitled to all of them and all of the things that happened to them while they're at that stay or at that doctor's appointment. And that's the purpose of that section. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Uh, for bringing this bill. Um, thank you for having the courage to do this because I know this is a lot. Uh, Ms. Morris, um, my head is spinning. Uh, this, is, this is a lot. Um, and I want to say personally thank you for the witnesses who came forward. And we all have our stories. Um, and I think that the, the part that is most critical is the right to honesty between a patient and their doctor, right? We're human, we all make mistakes. But if I can't trust you as my doctor to tell me the truth, even if it's not great news, I, I think that that's, that's um, sad that we even have to have that in section uh, four, uh, paragraph one. Can you speak, um, my question is, can you speak to, um, what is happening with insurance companies buying practices and owning practices and hospitals and, and where we are with 
the ability to not be able to break that veil because we have insurance companies who are not just insuring doctors, but now also own practices and in some cases hospitals. And what are you seeing in our environment, how that's affecting uh, since St. Paul left and we've got new players, how is that affecting the, the atmosphere of the delivery of care in our communities? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I have seen that a lot. I mean, one, I think it speaks to the enormity of the money that these insurance companies have. They can go in and buy up the practices. They can go in and buy up hospitals. I think the issue that comes from that is it takes away the autonomy of the doctors and the medical staff that work there to have ownership in the care that they're given. I think that that is a danger point, where as opposed to they have this position of the role of being a medical provider, they're kind of employees now of an insurance company. And these insurance companies are unfortunately focused on the bottom line as opposed to the level of patient care. And so I think it's important to keep an eye on that because these doctors, they go to medical school for years and years and years. And they get out and they want to practice and they want to have a life and they want to give good care. And the insurance companies unfortunately control everything. They control the amount of money they get per patient. They control the amount that they get paid for every single different type of insurance. They negotiate with them and they negotiate them lower and lower every year. And we don't want our medical providers exacerbated. We want to create a good environment for them. And though it's a little bit outside of what we're talking about, that's a way to create a great environment for getting medical providers and doctors to come to Nevada is to make sure that they are properly paid through these insurance companies. So they want to come here and they want to work and they aren't just kind of pawns for being bought up by them. And so that's definitely a trend that we're seeing and I think the danger of that is that we want good independent doctors who can establish their own practice and not look at, well, maybe I'll just get bought out by the insurance company later. They want to stay here. They want to keep in good practice. They want to have their patients. They want to be a referral source for every good doctor in the community. And that's something that is absolutely permeating through our state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll, we have our next question from Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for withstanding all of our questions. I know it's many. Um, so I, I really appreciate the, the push to get justice for victims and wanting to um, assist them right with the, the non-economic damages. I just had a question on the repealed section. So 7.095 simply removes the caps on how much attorneys can take from these settlements. So if this is about victims, why are we including that in there so that victims are actually getting less from these settlements? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris. In order to get good quality representation, you have to be able to have lawyers who are willing to do the work. And it is extremely expensive to litigate a medical malpractice case. It takes time, it takes years, and it takes an area of expertise. And it is sad that the citizens of Nevada have few and far between to pick of us because it is not, quote, attractive to take it. Now, the defense, they have no limitations. They can spend as much as they want. They can charge as much as they want. They can work as many hours as they want. There's no limitation on that. Yet there's a limitation on getting the quality of representation for the injured party. And so all that does is even the playing field, is to take the limitations off the person who has the burden. I mean, as a plaintiff's counsel, you have the burden to prove it, and yet you're limited, while the defense is limitless, with billions of dollars at their fingertips and no limitation at all. And so the goal of that is to even the playing field and allow for an open market where people can go and hire the attorney that they would like to hire, and the attorney wants to take their case. There just aren't enough of us. We need more. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblyman Ornlicker. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for answering all our questions. I want to follow up on an earlier question and your response to it from Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. She asked about how will this help future patients, and you said deterrence. And as a legislator and a law professor, I want to believe in deterrence. I teach it 
and it's important principle. But I also know sometimes what happens in practice doesn't always coincide with theory. So I'm going to quote from a study that I'm guessing our, the uh, other side is going to present. So I want to make sure you have a chance to respond to it, because otherwise you may not. And this was in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association in January 2020, fairly recent study by a group of pretty respected people in the field of tort law, malpractice especially. And they did describe a systematic review of studies on the relationship between quality of care and, and tort laws. And you've probably seen the study. So as I said, I want to make sure you have a chance to respond. And their conclusion is in this systematic review, most studies found no association between measures of malpractice liability risk and healthcare quality and outcomes. Although gaps in the evidence remain, the available findings suggested that greater tort liability, at least in its current form, was not associated with improved quality of care. So as I said, I want to give you a chance to respond. Thank you, Assemblyman. Christian Morris. Um, it's always difficult when you're addressing a study because there are so many studies. There are studies that show when there are caps on damages that there is more risky procedures taken, less radiography done, that suboptimal care is not addressed. There are studies that say kind of what they're saying is there's no correlation. And I think that we need to look at what is the reality because what you teach, what you preach is human nature. And when you look at what a medical provider has, you've got a message to them, it's okay if you don't do what you need to do, we're gonna protect and limit that liability. That's what the message is. When the message is something different, which is we want good care, to say that that doesn't result in good care by showing them that the law says you need to follow this good practice. But the reality is, is that you want to look at what human nature is. The studies say that there's no correlation while there's missing data. There's other studies that say that you will get more risky procedures and less care where there is no fear of repercussions, where there is no fear of it. And when you look at what we're talking about, kind of like risk management with hospitals, there are bodies that look at risk analysis, right? What is our risk? And when you have that risk analysis, people tend to do less risky behavior when there are consequences. When someone is reprimanded, they will less likely repeat that action. When something happens in a practice, everyone hears about it and people are careful. And so to say that one study or a study that you just referenced says that there's no correlation kind of behooves human nature. Because when someone, and that's why we, when people are reprimanded, it gets printed even in our legal magazine. I always read through to see what bad things lawyers are doing to make sure that I'm never going to do that again. And that's how we learn. We learn from one, unfortunately, other people's mistakes. And sometimes people learn from their own. And the idea is they don't repeat it. And so while they might have areas in which they can say, wow, there's just absolutely no correlation, does not look at what the purpose of this is. Because it's either a message to say, it's OK to have suboptimal care, bad care, or we're demanding good care in our state, is a different message. And if it doesn't have a good result, I'm sure we can address that. But we know now that as it currently sits, it is not solving our problem of lack of medical providers. It is not solving our problem by people's agony and pain being pushed to the wayside. It's not solving our problem of giving our citizens access to the courthouse. And so when we look at the results of what we currently have versus what the message is by addressing this law, then we won't be looking to see what's the best outcome. Because other than that, what would be the point of this arbitrary cap? If you think about it with your earlier question, it's so arbitrary, yet there's no good outcome to it. And that's where I think we need to look at is why arbitrarily limit the value of human life in Nevada if there's no good outcome? Why not demand a higher standard and get a better outcome? I hope that answers your question. Um, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. And thank you so much for your question. You know, as many folks know, I'm a PhD student here. And so I can speak to when it comes to um, developing a research study, right? Where did these research studies come from? Are we studying Nevada? What are we actually talking about when we get into the weeds of a study? So I would say it's hard to testify against a study. Um, and 
you know, we can talk more offline about that. But also, if we're saying that victims, I'm sorry, if we're saying that there's no correlation to the quality of care with the cap, so then the opposite is true, right? Are we leaving victims out with no access to justice when they do have these bad infractions? I guess that's just a question to be for the other side when they come up here. With that, our next question is from Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair, for the second question. Um, and I, I just wanted to follow up on um, Assemblywoman Cohen's question about Section 1.1. So, um, the uh, provider of health care shall not knowingly make a false or misleading statement or um, prevent, hinder, or delay the person. So, what would be considered delayed? Is it, there's no time limit on that, so they could just be charged you know, is it 30 days, is it 60 days, what's a delay? And then if it's determined, well, you took too long, so now you're subject to a fine. So if um, you could answer that, please. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris, I think I understand your question. I want to make sure that I do. Is the issue is that goes really to the statute of limitations. So what will happen is if there's a misleading statement, if there are information that's omitted or uh, not disclosed to the patient, the patient has this statute of limitations of one year in which to do it. If they don't know the malpractice occurred, they can never hit their statute of limitations. And so the idea is to not hinder the patient from the lack of knowledge because they don't hold any kind of medical knowledge generally. They have to rely on what the doctor is saying. They have to rely on what the medical records show to know that something bad happened, which is why they have their adverse outcome. Because the reality is, is there are adverse outcomes that come from no, no point of medical negligence. It's just an adverse outcome. But generally, when there is some sort of uh, non-disclosure, where there is some sort of misleading, it's because they're trying to obviously cloak what happened in the procedure that resulted in the adverse outcome. And so the point is to say you cannot mislead and therefore have them miss the statute of limitations. It hinders their ability to actually hit the statute of limitations. And that's what the point is, is one, you can't mislead. You cannot be untruthful with your patient and you can't do it for the purpose of them not being able to meet the statute of limitations in which they could bring the action. I hope that answers your question. Do you want to follow up? Um. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, looking at this from a little different perspective, one thing that concerns me is, is access to care. Uh, working in the ER, you know, now, I mean, say this all goes through these docs, you know, oh my gosh, we're going to get penalized, you know, yada, yada, yada. Now we're going to have to run additional tests, you know, that may not be medical necessary, but now they've got to form their practice and their procedure around protecting themselves as well as protecting their patient. Could this reduce access to care and drive up the cost of health care? I mean, when I worked in the ER, it wasn't uncommon to have patients were, you know, sitting in an ER for four hours. And, oh, by the way, the doctor wants now a clean catch urine sample on an infant baby because he thinks she might have a urinary tract infection, which won't affect the standard of care, you know, or the course he's going to take, but he's got to have that documentation. I mean, just that, you know, I just really think it's going to do two things, and I just want you to address, you know, will it address the, you know, the overall cost of care, which I think it will, and will it reduce access to care because people are going to be less willing to go to an ER because they know they're going to have to wait longer or, you know, less likely to get specialty tests because they know, you know, they're going to have to wait forever to get them, and it may not affect the, uh, the outcome at all. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman. Christian Morris. I think the reality is is that if there is a change in this law like we're talking about, the per people who are going to be put on notice of this realistically is the insurance companies because they're, they're the ones who are the ones who kind of control everything regarding money. However, what you're saying is, is that there's a concern of kind of over-treatment, that they'll be concerned of, hey, I don't want to get this claim, so are we going to be over-treating the patient? And so we have to look at what the standards are in our community because unnecessary tests are not something that we want and or need. And to assume that a medical provider will start giving unnecessary tests without having trust in our medical community. 
because there is no need for unnecessary tests, and I haven't seen any evidence that doctors in other states that don't have this cap, that don't have these limitations, are providing unnecessary medical care. I haven't seen any statistics or studies that there has been a prevention of access to care or all of a sudden unnecessary uh, procedures or radiography being done because of a change in the law regarding this cap on damages. And so I don't know that I can speak to it because I haven't seen any evidence of it and I have enough faith in our medical providers that they would not start doing unnecessary tests to prevent. Would they be careful with their patients? Would there be more deterrence? Would risk management be watching their policies and procedures and supervision? Yes, I would hope for that. But I, don't, I can't speak to it because I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any evidence in other states of there being unnecessary or excessive care or prevention of patients going to get care because of it. I hope that answers. Um, Cecilia Gonzalez. Oh. Proceed. District 16, for the record, you know, I really appreciate your question about access to care and the concerns about unnecessary care because earlier today, right, we sat here and we heard victims that went through unnecessary medical um, treatments without penalties, and at the end of the day, they were even still billed for it. I, I want to point back to my opening remarks on how we are still 50th doctors per capita two decades later and we also have some of the lowest insurance or I'm sorry the lowest um, we have been been voted that we have the lowest cost to health care um, and so I think that there's a narrative here that is just inaccurate when we talk about access and cost um, like my colleague said thank you do you still want that follow-up please madam chair yes please proceed um, you know, I, I would opine that the standards of care would change because, you know, they're gonna, there's going to need to be a protection for the doctors as well as the insurance companies. I mean, wouldn't you agree that, the, you know, that that is taken into account for standards of care when, when they develop these standards? Thank you, Assemblyman. Christian Morris, absolutely. And I think standards are absolute what we want to focus on. But to say the standard would be then to be excessive standards would be something that we don't have any evidence of. Because standards do need to be followed. Policies and procedures do need to be adhered to and carefully watched. And that's the goal. The goal is not to have it excessive. And to say that that would be the way that they would go, as opposed to carefully monitoring what's occurring, let's just say, in their hospital, to make sure that there is the proper staffing and supervision, is the goal of it. Obviously, it's not to have excessive and to say that that's how they would then spend their money as opposed to more supervision, which is not what we'd want. We want more supervision. We want more adherence to policies and procedures. And that's not the direction that we would anticipate that they would go or spend the unnecessary dollars to do it. So I think that that's something that has to be ob obviously monitored and being careful of making sure that doesn't occur. But these ov obviously are facilities which are in the business of being in business. And so to be spending unnecessary dollars in that area as opposed to adhering to policies and procedures wouldn't actually financially benefit them. It would be more of a standard of care in which their facility meets all of its measures. And that's what the goal is there. Um, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16, for the record, I also want to point you to this slide. Um, only one hospital in our entire state has one more star rating. So if our standard of, if our concerns are about standards of care, I don't know how much lower we can get than that. I just want to put that on the record. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair. So I'd like to talk about the repealed section, the um, settlement con conference section um you know our states had as far as i know really good success with adr and so why why is it necessary to repeal the settlement conference thank you assemblywoman christian morris you know practically almost every case goes to a settlement conference and or a mediation and the way that happens is generally the judge will say do the parties here wish to get a settlement conference and both parties have to agree in order to go there. And frankly, that's how they're successful, is the parties actually want to go to a settlement conference. So the idea here is that they're not forced to go to a settlement conference, and that's the difference. And generally, forced settlement conferences are not successful because that doesn't mean that both parties wanted to be there and come together and talk. And so what it does is it allows it to be a choice to both parties in order to attend that settlement conference and not just mandatory. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question will be from Assemblywoman Hansen. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up along the lines of my uh, colleague, Assemblywoman Gallant, um, regarding how many cases, um, I don't know that we got the answer, how many cases or just even the percent that are settled. But before you answer that, if you could, it's my understanding that 8th Judicial Court um, has had a specialty court added so that they can handle the caseload. So if you could maybe let us know if you have the number here, and if not, get, get it to us. Uh, what is the percentage of cases settled? And then what is the percentage that the attorneys get from the victim's compensation, if you know that? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris. Now, every year it changes because for a while we didn't even have trials going on down at the courthouse. The reality is, is that not just medical malpractice cases, all cases, a majority of them settle. And there are many reasons why cases settle. Trial is extremely expensive. Trial is extremely stressful. What you just saw here today from the victims who stood up and spoke, it took everything from them. To do that in a court of law, many of them do not want to relive that. Many of them need closure and need to move on. And the idea of settlement is that you take less and everyone's risk is resolved. And so it's hard to measure, well, what does it matter if a medical malpractice case goes to trial or not? What A case doesn't go to trial because you have to have a trial-ready attorney. You have to have a party who's willing to do it. You've got to have the funding to do it. That's why trials are so few and far between. The reason why we have the specialty court in the 8th District is because medical malpractice cases are complex. They have more requirements than a regular court, and we need people who are experienced in the area. So the specialty courts weren't created because, or court wasn't created because there's just so many of them. It's because we wanted organization, both sides, in order to handle these complex cases. And unlike regular cases where you go before the court and you just do a status check, in medical malpractice you do sweeps where they all come together and the judge, currently Judge Weiss, kind of handles all of those because he's experienced in the area. And so the reason why we have the specialty court isn't because there's just so many of them, it's because we wanted organization in the handling of them because they are unique they are different and they are complex and so that's where it's it's different and I don't have the exact numbers for you and I can get those to you as to what the current law is on the percentage of what attorney's fees are but it's a percentage per the amount of the money that is resolved and I can get that for you and it's staggered but I can tell you for attorneys that do handle these cases that is not the focus the focus is making sure that what happened comes to light and it doesn't happen to anyone else. And it is not an easy task and it is not one that we take lightly because it is very important. But we all know how important it is that we be able to trust that our loved ones and ourselves can trust our doctor when we go there. And it is epically important that it be on the table and that it be looked at. But the reality is, is that's why we have to have this checks and balances. And this conversation is so important because it has consequences to all parties and to all sides. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblyman Yurick. Thank you, Chair. I have a question about how the insurance uh, is or the premiums for the doctors uh, play out. If you can answer this, I'm not sure. Um, for example, if I have an auto insurance policy, if I mean, obviously there are actuaries and insurance set their rates um, on on a on a regular basis. But if I file a claim again, my my son crashes our car or something like that, my insurance rates are going to go up. Can you help me put that in the context of medical malpractice? So if there are an increase in let's say claims, are all doctors going to get hit with these increased premiums? Or are the individual doctors that get more claims, is it their individual rates that would go up more significantly? Uh, thank you, Assemblyman. Christian Morris, uh, that's a great question. I know it's a big concern. One thing I want to address about insurance rates is even when we put this law in effect, it was you know, to keep our doctors in Nevada, and their rates have continued to go up. That has not occurred. I mean, my husband's been practicing here for years, and his rates only go up. They don't go down, which was kind of the illusion when we put this rule into place. But the reality is, is it's not kind of what you're talking about is all rates go up. It's individualized for your malpractice insurance based on your actions. And so if you are a doctor who has had 20 claims and they're valid claims, then you're going to have a higher rate. Not everyone in the community is going to. You are going to because there is obviously some risk 
analysis by that insurance carrier, and every doctor has different insurance carriers, and every rate is different, and they shop around, they negotiate for them, but there will be, of course, if they're having multiple claims, their rates will increase. And that's a reality for anyone, even when you get behind the wheel of the car. If there is something and, you know, you're in a DUI, your insurance rate is going to go up. Your neighbor's is not, but yours will. And so that is the reality of that kind of system, is that you do have to, and that is something that does actually have an impact on a doctor. They want less claims, irrespective of that, because they don't want their rates to go up. But their rate doesn't go up based on how much exposure they have. Their rate goes up based on the fact that they had a valid claim that was made on their insurance. It doesn't go up to my knowledge that, hey, we had to pay out X, so you have now have to pay this. The rates go up in a titrated matter. And so the level of exposure of the doctor doesn't control how much the rate goes up. It goes up because a claim was made or multiple claims were made. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the second question. Um, Ms. Morris, can you talk about policies where uh, something called a diminishing policy uh, where defense attorneys get paid less money um, and then the, what's left goes to the victims? What, what is this all about? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Christian Morris. So I kind of refer to it as like an eat away policy. And what that means is that there's a policy, and let's just say hypothetically, the policy is $100,000. So for every hour that the insurance defense uh, attorney bills on that policy, they get paid out of the policy and it diminishes. And so there'll be times where, you know, it's, oh, it's time for resolution. We have an eat away or a diminishing policy. There's only $20,000 left because we spent 80000 on uh, the insurance defense attorney and some experts, so 20000 is all that there is. So that's what a diminishing policy is. Please proceed. Okay. So I'm, an, I'm a doctor. I have a policy. It's a million dollars. I am sued. I have to hire somebody to defend me. I start with a million. My attorneys chew up, you know, a half a million dollars in their fees. So that means only a half a million dollars is left to settle the case and pay the victim of something that I, I've done wrong? Is that what you're saying? Christian Morris, uh, yes, Assemblywoman, I am. I haven't seen them in medical malpractice as often as I see it in other certain situations. And so I have not had personally an experience of a diminishing policy with a medical malpractice case. However, if you were faced with that, that would be exactly the outcome. That when it diminishes, that is, quote, all that is left. And that would be all that it is able to be, quote, given or, uh, you know, decided for the victim. So that's what the diminishing policy means. I have not seen it consistently in medical malpractice cases, uh, but if it were in effect, that would be exactly correct. The 500,000 that went to the insurance uh, attorneys and the experts, that would be gone and all that would be is the remainder. Thank you for that. I believe that at this time, the members have asked all their questions. I want to, I think we all want to thank you um, for your stan stanima, stan stamina and um, uh, for, for responding to all the questions and everything. But at this point, we can give you a little reprieve. Again, thank you for um, responding to all the questions. What we're going to do now is we're going to open it up for testimony in support of Assembly Bill 209. And now... Again, we ask that everyone keep their comments brief, usually around two minutes each. And again, we will um, move between here in Carson City, Las Vegas, and of course the telephone lines. You are absolutely welcome to say ditto if someone hits points and makes remarks um, 
that yours would be redundant to. You absolutely can, you know, just state your name and say ditto. So with that, uh, we will first start here in Carson City. Those who would like to come and testify and support, remember, for everyone testifying, we need you to say your name, spell it so that we have it accurate for the record. And with that, if there's anyone that would like to come forward for Assembly Bill 209 here in Carson City, again, there's three chairs, so you can just fill them at once and keep kind of rotating out. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Tess Opferman here on behalf of the Nevada Women's Lobby. The Nevada Women's Lobby feels strongly that we must amend our medical malpractice caps, and this is the time to do so. We have heard one story after another of victims who have faced negligent treatment and have no recourse. We're particularly supportive of this bill because these caps unfairly affect women and low-income families more than higher-income families. There are victims who have received unnecessary hysterectomies and have been rendered entirely infertile because of medical negligence. These cases have no economic damages because they don't prevent someone from working and won't affect their income. Therefore, they are subject to the $350,000 cap. Who, children who are killed because of medical negligence are not wage earners and therefore have limited access to economic damages. They are also subject to the non-economic damage malpractice caps of 350,000. Seniors are no longer wage earners and because a family is not dependent on their income, they are also limited to economic damages. These caps are so low, victim survivors of these cases cannot even retain a lawyer to attempt to get some compensation for these egregious cases. They are forced to deal with the outcome of medical malpractice, oftentimes for the rest of their life, and are forced to bear the burden of additional medical costs associated with the medical error. In addition to the full repeal of malpractice caps, we are supportive of the extension of the statute of limitations. What if the medical malpractice creates an issue that doesn't appear until a later date? These individuals should have access to justice and should be given additional time to pursue a case. Though we certainly don't want to force doctors, and especially OBGYNs, out of the state, many states, and especially those with better health care, have significantly higher medical malpractice caps and a full 14 states have no caps at all. We do need to address health care in our state, making sure we have nurses and doctors willing to work. But part of the solution is holding entities accountable, holding insurance companies accountable, holding hospitals accountable, and holding bad doctors accountable. With each year that medical malpractice caps remain steady, we give victims less and less access to justice. We must give victims some room for recourse and urge you to pass AB 209. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Serena Evans, and I'm the policy director for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. Never in my time as a domestic and sexual violence victim advocate did I think I would be involved in medical malpractice, but recently, NCE, DSV, and direct service providers in northern Nevada have been working with a large group of women who have experienced alleged reproductive coercion, medical mutilation, and sexual assault at the hands of a prominent OBGYN. I say alleged not because I do not believe them, because open investigations are pending that have yet to conclude final findings. Many of these victim survivors want to share their stories, but because of the vulnerability of their experiences and the powerful um, profile of this doctor here in our community, they are fearful of sharing them on public record. Today I am honored to be here on behalf of those numerous victim survivors to uplift their voices and share just a small piece of their stories. Working with this group of individuals, I have heard horror stories that have made me sick to my stomach. At the hands of one doctor, numerous women have experienced unnecessary procedures, sexual assault, botched surgeries, becoming infertile, and medical coercion. For many of these individuals, the extent of the harm that this doctor has caused was not known until a few months later, and they were then forced to wait many months to see another OBGYN to get answers, eating up at the time of the statute of limitations. The damage caused goes beyond just physical pain and medical complications, but has left these individuals traumatized, emotionally scarred, and fearful of ever trusting another doctor again. Medical malpractice is the only route for these victims to seek justice, and the cap for damages is far too low. Many of these women that I have had the pleasure of working with need numerous reconstructive surgeries and ongoing and intensive medical care, all at their own expense. NCE DSV is here today as a voice for the voiceless in support of AB 209, as this bill will allow them to hold this predatory and harmful doctor accountable for the damage and pain he has placed upon these victims and their families. Thank you.
Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. I'm here today to show our support for AB 209. Additionally, I want to thank Assemblywoman Gonzalez for working on this important measure. Medical negligence protections have left all Nevadans with worse health care and little to no recourse. I urge your support of AB 209 so we can increase accountability and the quality of health care in our state. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Atar Hasibula, first name spelled A-T-H-A-R, last name H-A-S-E-E-B-U-L-L-A-H. -E -E I'm the Executive Director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Nevada. Uh, I'm also a civil rights lawyer by background, one of few civil rights lawyers in the state, and part of the reason why I'm one of few civil rights lawyers in the state is because these caps and what's occurred with respect to uh, policies that are in place here have actually precluded an entire generation of civil rights lawyers from moving forward. The cost of litigating these measures is extremely high. The likelihood uh, in court isn't always great. And one thing that's always come up whenever we get a request that comes in um, is that folks really, really need help and there's not an attorney available. Uh, we can't fault private attorneys in that instance for not taking those cases because the risk becomes so high. I would estimate that probably about a third of the requests that I end up getting are related to medical malpractice. That is not something that we really engage in. Obviously, we're a constitutional shop first and foremost, um, but because that overflow exists, there's no one to really uh, refer out to in that way. We're hoping that if this bill is passed, we can at least start the process of making sure that ecosystem's a little bit better and that we don't continue to have those numbers in droves and we don't have to continue to reject people when they've had uh, egregious actions uh, occur simply because these caps are in place and preclude the ability for justice to, to actually uh, be issued here. We urge you to really support this bill moving out of committee. Um, I, you know, and we're very, very grateful to the sponsor and the stakeholders for bringing this forward because the impact that it's had on non nonprofit legal service providers in the state of Nevada that are practicing law has been tremendous. Thanks. Hi, my name is Pat Fries, F-R-I-E-S, and the only thing I have against this bill is that nurses are to have I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. We are in support right now. Well, that and, is for support, except okay, for the one line. I, okay, so the rules of our committee, and I, I should have stated it at the beginning okay. of our testimony again, the rules of our committee is that in order to support it, you support it in its entirety. Okay, okay sorry about that. So if you'd like to come back up for opposition or neutral. Neutral. Okay. Can I do for neutral then, ma'am? Sure. Okay. I just want to make sure I get it right the next time. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Is there anyone else here in support of Assembly Bill 209? All right. Not seeing anyone. They're in Las Vegas. Is there anyone in support of Assembly Bill 209? Okay, broadcasting, will you open the lines, please? To testify in support of Assembly Bill 209, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify in support at this time. Okay, thank you for that. Then we will go ahead and open it up for opposition here in Carson City. Again, the table is available, so just come up. Let me just, just so we have an idea of time, raise your hand if you're here to um, speak in opposition. Okay, so again, that's many folks in the room. So again, um, please fill the table up and let's keep it moving, just kind of rotating in and out. Again, remember to state your name. Please spell it for the record. Okay. And please proceed when you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Antonio Tadeo Alamo, A-N-T-O-N-I-O, uh, middle, middle name Tadeo, T-A-D-E-O, last name Alamo, A-L-A-M-O. Madam Chair and fellow Assembly Judiciary Committee members, thank you for allowing me the privilege of presenting today. Madam Chair, I believe because I'm the first speaker, um, there was a little latitude to allow me five minutes to speak. Um, that, so that means that I will be the only one. I, well, I, that was under the impression. Okay, um, so you will be the only one speaking. That, that, every, is, that is correct because I'm going to give a history. And then everyone else is speaking for two minutes. That's correct. Everyone else <laughs> in the room in Las Vegas on the phones. 
<laughs> All right. That is correct. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Proceed. You, thank you, Madam Chair, for that latitude. I'm an internal medicine physician, son of Cuban parents. I was born in Reno, raised in Las Vegas. I left the state of Nevada for eight years to do my training at USC, and I came home to practice medicine, something that didn't happen very often back then. I sit here in kind of a deja vu fashion. Um, when I left my office yesterday to come here, there was a, a ID badge that sits on my desk and been sitting there for over two decades. And on it is a very thin uh, version of me with black thick hair. And it's, uh, it's dated in 2002 and it's got my name on it. And that was during the special session. I was here in this room 20 years ago over the same exact topic. My testimony is gonna give an example of time travel more historical than anything else. I came back to Nevada after my training in 94, beginning of my first six years of practice, and there was a malpractice crisis. My mom and wife worked in the office so I could save money. My malpractice premiums had doubled. My colleagues and surgical specialists had a threefold increase in their malpractice premiums. I was moonlighting in urgent cares at night and weekends to help overcome the malpractice premium increases. I was not the only one suffering this plight. This plight caused many doctors to roll up their practices and leave Nevada. Leaving Las Vegas was not an option for me. It was my home. A three-day special session was called by then-Governor Kenny Gwynn. After the three days with little and no sleep, a good law was created with limits that helped stabilize the crisis. In the following two years, a ballot initiative occurred which tightened up and made near perfect what we attempted to do during the special session. That ballot initiative was supported by over 60% of the Nevada population. The number of frivolous lawsuits decreased. More insurance companies returned back to Nevada. Premiums began to normalize in a predictable insurance market. Crisis was over. Here I stand now 20 years later on the opposite end of my career, the last hopefully six years of my career. And I sit here and I testify as a, as a one doctor not representing any employer, health plan, or hospital. There's no, I'm not testifying here with political theater. I'm just letting you know what will happen again. It's just math, business math of insurance companies. I lived it. These caps kept the premiums at a certain level, but it reaches, when it reaches a threshold where frivolous lawsuits become the norm as before, we'll be back to where we were in 2002. And the biggest hit was pediatrics, ob and specialists, but everybody suffered. Look, I've chosen a profession that exists to help people, and most definitely malpractice is a tragedy, and it does affect a small number of people. That was mentioned before. It's awful when it happens. It's tragic when it happens. I'm not gonna deny it. My eyes watered when those brave people came up here and testified. In fact, I'm gonna water again. It's awful. But we need to work together for the fix. This bill is not gonna curb and fix the malpractice issue. We need to fix things on the front end of the incident, not after the tragedy already happened. Beware of the law of unintended consequences. We cannot afford to get this wrong. We have increased our physician numbers in Nevada in the last two decades, but the population outpaced us. We cannot afford to lose any doctors to leaving early retirement or discourage new grads from coming to Nevada. George Santayana said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it, and we will repeat it. The problem is not, is it, we're not trying to affect a small number of people. This will affect the entire state, all the people, because every one of us eventually become patients in the medical system, including myself. This is going to affect access and medical care the way this law is written. It doesn't fix the problem. Again, I'm here just as one doctor, look around the room, one of the oldest doctors, and the one that sat here 20 years ago, not representing anybody but myself and the profession of the state of Nevada. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think I only took four minutes. And four I minutes and 15 seconds. Get those 45 <laughs> seconds in. <laughs> but, but thank you, and I appreciate this time and this privilege to be in front of every one of you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Hello, members, um, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Bio Curry Winchell, a long last name, so you'll stay with me as I spell it out, B-A-Y-O-C-U-R-R-Y dash W-I-N-C-H-E-L-L. I wish I could get some of those minutes back from spelling my name, but I will proceed. Um, I am a physician and medical director who is focused and passionate about improving health equity. And when I say health equity, that is a powerful word. And we often forget what does that mean. And for me, it really means having a voice for people of color in healthcare and those that are marginalized and underserved. And so in Northern Nevada, I represent about eight black physicians here. And so why I start with that, when we talk about health equity and we talk about access, we have to talk about how are we going to improve it, not how are we going to stop it. And so right now, my drive is to see how I can increase representation in Nevada for people of color. Representation improves health outcomes. Representation improve, improves access. And overall, it helps with health equity. And so when we're talking about this and we're saying it's going to improve access, improve quality, I think as a black female physician, how am I going to get more doctors of color to come to Nevada and practice in those areas that we know we often serve? And so that is a big piece when we talk about access and quality. Nevada is trying to move that needle. And so when we have laws like this or bills that may pass, we have to focus on the people that it will actually affect. And we need to improve, yes, access. But what does that mean? More doctors and more doctors of color, more doctors to be able to be, go into medical school and then go into residency and find ways to uncouple unconscious bias. And those are the things that, it, that actually affect health outcomes. So as a black female physician, I'm here to represent myself and share that piece in hopes that I can raise the alarm on the need for more people of color that are healthcare physicians. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Suji Reganti, S-U-J-I-I, -I, my first name, last name is Reganti, R-E-G-A-N-T-I. I'm a medical oncologist and also NSMA president-elect. I've been practicing in the community for the last 16 years. I strongly oppose AB 209. <coughs> As a practicing physician in Nevada for 16 years, as we know, like, Nevada is infamous for physician shortage. In fact, Nevada is below the national average in 33 of the 39 physician specialty areas. That statistic is just not a number. It, it has a real impact on us. Passing this bill, the consequences will be detrimental, not only to physicians, but also to the patients. This will result in physician shortage, making it very difficult for our patients to receive access to healthcare in timely fashion. The major consequence of this bill, A, it's going to force the physicians to retire or to leave the state. And with every doctor we fail to keep in Nevada, we add more strain and burnout to our remaining workforce and increase wait times. Being a medical oncologist, I cannot believe my patients not, re not receiving access to healthcare in timely fashion. It is life and death for them. And my second concern is young physicians and students that are in training right now. I'm concerned that they're going to choose non-clinical, like they're going to go join the pharmaceutical companies for their future jobs, which again will decrease the workforce in our Nevada. Nevada is already ranked 48th in nation for overall health care. We must focus on legislation that will not only increase this ranking, but increase the accessibility of proper health care. Please oppose AB 209 that will endanger a fragile healthcare system. Thank you for your time for listening. Uh, thank you. And members, may I, I did not mention I oppose 209. Sorry, I apologize for the record. <laughs> thank you for clarifying that. Good morning. I'm Laura Shook, L A U R A S H O O K. I'm an emergency medicine physician in Reno. I work for Northern Nevada Emer Emergency Physicians, and I completed residency last summer in Seattle, Washington. I moved to Reno in August to build a life with my husband and my career in emergency medicine. 
I love my job and I'm so proud to work here in Nevada. It took an immense amount of effort to attain a job out of state after residency and most doctors will end up living and working in the same state in which they train. AB 209 would make it extremely challenging to recruit other young physicians. Please support our patients, our doctors, and our access to healthcare by opposing AB 209. Good morning. My name is Aiden Gould, G-O-U-L-D. I'm a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and a former major in the Marine Corps. I currently work for Northern Nevada Emergency Physicians as an ER doctor in Reno. I am here today to respectfully ask you to consider opposing Bill AB 209. The reasons I joined the military were that I wanted to be part of something greater than myself and to serve my country. After I got out of the service, I went to medical school because I still had the drive to be part of something great, to be proud of what I do and of paramount importance to me to continue to be of service. While working in the medical field, I have come across countless physicians over widespread specialties who have the same drive to be part of something important and to be of service, particularly to the people of this community. Throughout my career seeing patients in the ER, I have never heard a single person tell me their priority is increased malpractice payouts. What I hear every single day that I practice is that my patients cannot get in to see their primary care physician for weeks or even months, that they cannot get seen in follow-up by a majority of specialty for months. Sometimes my patients even have to go to other states or as a last resort, resort, they return time and again to the ER, often sicker because we do not have the specialty available or more often because the wait times are so long they cannot be seen in any reasonable time frame. This crisis certainly affects those who are socioeconomically vulnerable, but you are not immune even if you are educated or financially secure. Everyone is impacted. Our medical community is already stretched thin. If we make Nevada a less supportive and unfriendly climate for practitioners by increasing malpractice premiums, one of the resorts of, excuse me, results of supporting Bill 209, it will be even more difficult to recruit and retain excellent physicians. Access to physicians will worsen, wait times will become even longer, and patient care in our state will suffer. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, my name is Paul Hauptman, H-A-U-P as in Paul, T as in Tom, Mann, M-A-N. I'm the Dean at the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine. I'm also representing Dr. Mark Kahn, Dean of UNLV Med, who is unable to attend in person today. Legislature has taken a major step forward during the current session by considering in bipartisan fashion bills that are specifically designed to address the physician shortage in Nevada. For example, bills supporting funding of new graduate medical education programs and multiple ambitious loan repayment options. I'd like to remind the committee that according to data from the Office of Statewide Initiatives at UNR, Nevada ranks between 45th and 50th in every category of physician supply. Based on a rate of 225 physicians per 100,000 population, Nevada needs an additional 2,450 physicians just to meet the national rate of 301 physicians per 100,000 population. Despite these glaring statistics, and in spite of well-designed efforts to support GME and loan repayment during the biennium, you are now at the same time considering AB 209, which will have a chilling effect on ongoing attempts to keep our medical students and trainees in Nevada and limit our ability to attract new physicians to the state. So which is it? Do we want to increase the supply of physicians, thereby improving patient access or not? Do we want to attract new businesses who can be confident that their employees will have ready access to health care or not? Finally, raising the cap will not improve quality of care. As you heard from Assemblyman Orent Licker today, there are no reliable, well-designed studies that directly show an improvement in quality or outcomes. The JAMA study that he cited su summarized 37 studies in a meta-analysis. And as Assemblyman Gray has suggested, the costs of care increase as patients are subjected to more and often invasive testing with no clear benefit. I encourage you to vote no on AB 209 in order to improve health care access in Nevada. Thank you. 
My name is Yolanda Edsel, that's spelled I-O-L-A-N-D-A. E-D-S-A-L-L. -L. I'm a board certified OBGYN here in town. I'm a proud Nevada native. I went to Nevada schools. I started my practice with OBGYN Associates in 2017 and I'm now a fully vested partner and partial business owner. My family's called Nevada home since the late 1800s and I've never wanted to live anywhere else. My primary objective as a physician has been to provide the same quality of care for my patients that I would want for my family. Now my career timing has been very fortunate. I wasn't working during the healthcare crisis in the early 2000s. I never was unable to afford my malpractice insurance. I never had to grapple with difficult decisions such as do I give up obstetrics? Do I need to relocate my practice out of state to keep my doors open? And the reason why is because of medical malpractice reform. The citizens of Nevada were given the facts and they were given the agency to make the determination if malpractice reform would serve them favorably and the resounding answer was yes. And I know you're all aware that unfortunately Nevada continues to rank poorly in our access to health care statistics, but our workforce is aging. The average age of physicians here in Nevada is 55 and my practice is no different. Nearly half my partners plan retirement in the next decade. Nevada's only hope is to try to recruit a younger workforce that not only sees the value but feels safe in coming to practice in our state. I know the survival of my practice is going to rely on this. Now, th this is unfortunately the healthcare climate that Nevadans already have to struggle to cope with. Just imagine the AB 404 and AB 209 pass. Well, this is going to drive up everyone's malpractice rates, unfortunately. I am personally afraid some of my partners may give up obstetrics early. I'm afraid some of my partners may choose early retirement. I'm afraid a lot of my medical colleagues are going to choose to leave the state entirely. And if you've ever had to wait six months to get in to see a healthcare provider, just imagine the frustration and quite frankly, the risk that's going to ensue if those practice wait times go up even longer um, for the scarce amount of docs that are left here. Oh, shoot. Well, as a physician and as a human being in Nevada, please, medical malpractice reform is as important now as 20 years ago. Thank you. Good, good morning, Madam Chair and, and Assembly members. My name is Katherine Parks. I'm here on behalf of the Liability Cooperative of Nevada, or LICON. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my client and I's opposition to AB 209. I do not envy you your jobs as it relates to decisions uh, such as what's at issue with AB 209. It is, it is difficult. It was what was pointed out by the Nevada Supreme Court in TAM versus 8th Judicial District Court uh, when, when the court upheld the damage caps. It says, it is the interest of government in ensuring that adequate and affordable health care is available to the citizens of this state. They had to balance the rights of malpractice patients against that critical issue, as you've heard the doctors talk about. Make no mistake, the outright repeal of the, safeguard, uh, the safeguards in current uh, existing legislation, removing the obligation or the requirement that people go to settlement conferences, removing the cap on attorney's fees that can be charged by plaintiff's attorneys in malpractice cases, removing the joint and several liability or the several liability requirement that's currently in the statute, each one of the repeal of these measures is going to dramatically not only increase the number of malpractice cases that are filed in Nevada, but it's going to prolong them. Prolonging malpractice cases, increased litigation costs, will increase premiums, and will take a human toll on doctors uh, that are required or, or end up having to participate in litigation in this state. Uh, AB 209, uh, will increase litigation costs, it will increase time that is required to be spent by hospital staff in litigation. It will especially hurt the rural hospitals that make up LICON and make it more difficult to recruit physicians to come and work in their hospitals. And, and it will not um, ensure uh, that adequate and affordable health care is available to the citizens of Nevada and we would ask uh, that you consider opposing AB 209. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Adler with Silver State Government Relations. Today, I take pride in representing three clients, the Nevada Advanced Practice Nurses Association, or NAPNA, and 
Vitality Unlimited and New Frontier. These are both certified community behavioral health clinics and residential treatment centers for alcohol and drug. And so I bring to you the voice of other providers today, those CCBHCs and uh, residential treatment, they too have providers whom they need to insure. So Nevada, ha and, and I want to pause for a moment and applaud the bravery of the victims who spoke today and the vigor of the bill sponsor. Uh, their intentions are all very good. So Nevada faces many healthcare and behavioral healthcare challenges, but my clients absolutely believe AB 209 will move Nevada in the wrong direction. Kind of the summary I feel after listening to the presentation is that insurance is the target, but or in, yeah, insurance is the target, but providers are going to take the arrow. The cost of malpractice insurance and, make, and making providers bigger targets, my clients believe, will push early retirement, will push newly trained providers to choose another state, and also of great concern, will limit the access of Medicaid enrollees to care. In, in this building, I feel every day that we look and act like everyone in Nevada has enough income, housing, and health care. But there are more than 800,000 enrollees in Medicaid in Nevada. And what they need is better care that will come from better ratios of providers. They need better health and, and health equity that will come from providers who are available to treat the Medicaid population. And my clients very much are those providers. Um, you spoke, Assemblywoman La LaRue Hatch, of prevention. Excuse and, me. You're, am I done? Yes. Thank you. I'm thank done. you. Thank you. I, and I would just like to say I'll have um, you two testify, and then I'm going to move down to Las Vegas just because I know they've been so patiently waiting, and um, it's a different experience down there, and so I want to give them an opportunity. So we'll go to you two, then we'll go to Las Vegas for a while, um, and, and then, you know, we'll come back to Carson City, but I think it's you have to exercise a little more patience when you're in the room by yourself down there. So I, I, I want to be mindful of them as well in their schedule. So please continue. Good morning, Chair Miller and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Shauna Tello. I'm the Academic and External Affairs Administrator, and I'm here testifying in opposition to AB 209 on behalf of University Medical Center of Southern Nevada. Unlike all other hospitals in the state, UMC operates the only level one trauma center in Nevada. Our trauma center treats patients with life-threatening and other significant injuries. UMC's trauma center serves people from all over Southern Nevada, including parts of Utah and Arizona. A level one trauma center brings together medical specialists experienced in the fields of cardiothoracic surgery, orthopedics, ENT, ophthalmology, and other important specialists. The collaboration of these specialists in our trauma center significantly lowers the risk of a patient's death or disability. AB 209 will directly impact the operations of our level one trauma center. The specialists who staff our level one trauma center are generally not employees of UMC. Currently, NRS chapter 41, section 503 limits our medical provider's liability to 50,000 if their care or assistance was rendered in good faith and in a manner not amounting to gross negligence or reckless willful or wanton conduct. AB 209 repeals this statute, which will subject those medical providers who staff our trauma center to a substantial increase in medical malpractice premiums. As a result, our ability to staff the only level one trauma center in Nevada will be impacted significantly, which ultimately will impact access to care. I've already heard a lot about access to care, so this is a, a major concern. The increase to these providers' premiums would likely cause us to lose many of the medical providers whose expertise is gravely needed to treat those patients suffering <clears throat> from significant and life-threatening injuries. This is what occurred in 2002 when the UMC Trauma Center was shut down for 10 days. Nevada needs our Level 1 Trauma Center. We urge you to vote no on AB 209. Thank you. Thank you. And could you just state and spell your name for the record, please? Yes. I wasn't sure if that was your first name or your first and last, okay. but we want it. Um, my first name is Shauna, S-H-A-N-A, -A, and my last name is Tello, T-E-L-L-O. Thank, Thank you. you so much. 
I have my timer. It's not working. Sorry. My name Don't is worry, Jay. I have one. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> Jay Morgan, J-A-Y-M-O-R-G-A-N. And I'm representing myself and Nevada State Medical Association and your Nevada doctors. About 20 years ago, <clears throat> I walked into the ER, and a young man comes out with a blown pupil. 20 years old, got hit by a car, ran off the road, just hit him. We just took him to the operating room, took out a blood clot right after a CT scan. Well, he's a lawyer now, so. A young man or a young boy shoots himself in the head, two years old. I mean, I don't treat pediatrics, but my thought is, and we're going to the operating room, we're going to save the kid's life. He, f he misses a few words now and then, but he's really grown up to be quite a young man. I feel for patients, the patients who talk today. I live and die by my complications. And I tell you, it's, 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 I've, been, I've been here for 30 years, a black guy in Reno, Nevada, for 30 years. So, and, it's, and it's been interesting, a bit interesting time. But for physicians, we need some protection. We need some guardrails. But there should be some rules. We need to work together. We need to talk about this. AB 209 is not the way. It's, it may be a start. It may be something we can talk about, but it's not the way. If there's unlimited, unlimited ability to sue somebody, I, I may retire. I'm going to be 65. I don't feel like it. And I went back on ER call because I love taking care of patients and I love saving people. Thank you for listening. You have a good day. Thank you so much. All right, Las Vegas, let's begin. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Assembly members. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. That's E-R-I-K-P-E-A-R-S-O-N. And I'm speaking in opposition to AB 209. I'm a board-certified pediatric surgeon. I've been proudly serving the children and families in Nevada and surrounding regions for the past six years, and I co-own my practice with my two partners, Dr. Nicholas Fiore and Kelly Kogut, who have been serving this region for 20 years. I have two questions for you to consider. Who do you want to care for the sickest children in Nevada, and where do you want those children and families cared for? My answer to this is simple. I want a well-trained and experienced doctor for my child, and I want my child cared for as close to home as possible. We currently have an access crisis in children's care in Nevada. We have just five board-certified pediatric surgeons in our entire state, less than half the number of other states with similarly sized growing populations. We have just one pediatric neurosurgeon no pediatric ENT surgeons or peripheral vascular surgeons, causing many children and their families to travel out of state and delaying necessary care, carrying that impossible burden and economic weight. Our access crisis is not just in surgical specialties, but across all children's care, whether that is in the ER, the hospital, or the office. If you're a doctor for children or a parent and you try to make these appointments, you understand this challenge. What we need in Nevada is to become a magnet for pediatric physicians, surgeons, and subspecialists. Our practice recently recruited a pediatric surgeon from a celebrated program, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she has already made an impact in improving the care in Las Vegas. We must fill our care gaps by recruiting these experienced and well-trained pediatric doctors, keeping patients and their families in Nevada by making expert care available. Unfortunately, AB 209 does not protect patients. It does the opposite. It puts up the sir, gate to physician recruitment. Sir, your two minutes are up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And also just a reminder, too, that anyone that has anything in writing or wants to submit additional comments may do so, may submit it to the committee as well. Next, please. 
Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Katie Feldman, K-A-T-I-E, F-E-L-D-M-A-N, with Planned Parenthood Votes Nevada. Planned Parenthood Votes Nevada is here today in opposition to AB 209. We believe that patients who suffer adverse outcomes from the care they receive should be treated with compassion and provided financial compensation for the damages they suffer. However, today we are here to highlight serious concerns we have with moving the cap on non-economic damages from its previous level of $350,000, placing Nevada well outside the national norm on this issue. Just like all other healthcare providers in our state, Planned Parenthood's physicians and advanced practice clinicians cannot see our patients without professional liability insurance. And just like our colleagues here today, providing that coverage is one of our most significant operating costs. The increases we would see in our insurance premiums should AB 209 pass would make it just that much more difficult for us to see everybody who seeks our services regardless of their ability to pay. Apart from Planned Parenthood, OBGYNs are a critical part of the safety net care of care in Nevada. The increase in insurance costs AB 209 will no doubt impose will make it more difficult for hospitals and healthcare practices across our state to recruit and retain providers in a highly competitive national environment. We are not unfamiliar with the healthcare crisis of 2002, which caused the University Medical Center's trauma unit to close and led to the need for a special session addressing this very issue. For those reasons, Planned Parenthood urges you to oppose AB 209 today. Thank you. If we're ready, I'll go ahead. I'm Dr. Ursula Inga Ferguson, D.O. That's Ferguson, F-E-R-G-U-S-O-N. I came to Nevada uh, around 20 years ago in the physician user-friendly years. I recently came out of retirement in order to train new doctors for Nevada. So I am here speaking on behalf of myself, but also new doctor trainees and the patients we will be seeing. I'm internal medicine, so my patients have at least 10 problems each visit that they want to talk to me about, and they are persons. But the other persons in that room are their health insurance. We don't want the lawyers to be the fourth person in that exam room. We want time with patients, less time documenting, we don't want to add to the documentation to please the lawyers. Our documentation is for patient continuity of care, and that's the time that we want to preserve, is that time and that privacy, those moments that we have with that person face to face. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, my name is Katherine Turpin, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, Turpin, T-U-R-P-E-N. I am a lawyer and a partner of the law firm of John H. Cotton and Associates. I have been practicing law in Nevada since 2004, exclusively in the arena of professional liability and medical malpractice defense. My clients are Nevada's health care providers. They are the doctors, the nurses, and the medical clinics that provide care to Nevada's families. I am here today at, to testify in opposition to AB 209. I would first like to touch on quickly a question raised earlier that was not fully addressed. The Nevada Supreme Court has, in fact, ruled on the constitutionality of the non-economic damages cap. The case is Tam versus the 8th Judicial District Court, and it has been controlling case law in Nevada since 2015. The costs and risks associated with medical malpractice litigation operates as a function of continuing access to, <clears throat> to care. Specifically, I would like to talk with the uh, committee regarding the importance of maintaining NRS 41A045, which provides for several liability for health care providers. Practically speaking, as the law stands right now, if a medical malpractice provider proceeds to a jury trial, that provider is only responsible or liable for the percentage of fault the jury attributes to that provider. If you were to abolish several liability, that would turn malpractice cases into little more than car accident or general liability slip and fall cases, and they deserve more protection than that. If you were to abolish several liability, an individual provider could be held liable 
for damages caused by a co-defendant or by a provider who has not been named as a defendant in the lawsuit. This is not holding an industry accountable, but has actual real world implications to individual doctors and providers who provide care here in Nevada. Eliminating several liabilities. Excuse me, your two minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Deborah Cools, D E B O R A H. My last name is spelled K U H L S. Um, I am Assistant Dean for Research and Professor of Surgery at the Kirk Kikorian School of Medicine at UNLV. I'm a trauma surgeon and I've practiced at University Medical Center, Nevada's only level one adult trauma center and Nevada's only pediatric trauma center for 23 years. I was practicing here two, two decades ago when the original health care access crisis occurred. I witnessed Doctors leaving, I heard about patients dying because our trauma center needed to close and they were treated at non-trauma centers. And I heard cases of patients being told, oh, you're gonna go home in 15 minutes. And because those doctors were not properly trained, those patients died. I trained at one of the top trauma surgery fellowship programs in the country, and I came to Nevada to help Nevada citizens. I want to say that um, I also was one of only two trauma centers left standing at UMC, and I took 24-hour call every other day in order to help the injured people. I needed to transfer patients out of our state for orthopedic and other specialty care that I had never, ever done before in my career, and I, luckily I've never done uh, so since. I, I want to really tell you that to roll back um, the progress that was made in, in, the, in the emergency legislation um, is, is really going to jeopardize the health and well-being of, of Nevadans. You've already heard that we're uh, we are actually 45th in terms of active physicians per 100,000 population. Um, and that has improved somewhat in my 23 years here. Doctor? In the past two decades. Doctor, your two yes. minutes are up. Okay. I, I, I apologize. We are really trying to educate um, uh, medical students, residents, and keep doctors in Nevada. And I apologize um, that I ran over. It, it happens. It's, it's difficult unless the, the ones you'll see that are getting it in that two minutes, it's because they're very experienced in doing it and they're practiced at it. But we appreciate it that, you know, when, when you, that there's a lot of information and passion that everyone has. But we also want to make sure that we have the opportunity to hear from everyone individually as well. So thank you. Your comments are appreciated. Next testifier, I think we'll do the two more at the table there, and then we'll come back up here. Well, maybe we'll bounce to the phones for a little bit and then kind of rotate through again just to give everyone an opportunity. Please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and honored members of the committee. I am Dr. Wolfgang, W-O-L-F-G-A-N-G, -G, last name Gilliar, G-I-L-L-I-A-R, I am the Dean and Chief Academic Officer of Toro University in Nevada College of Osteopathic Medicine, and we are located in Henderson, Nevada. I am speaking in opposition to Bill AB 209. Toro Medical School graduates the majority of new doctors in the state of Nevada. This and last year reflect the record number of Toro Medical graduates, over 100, who are remaining in Nevada for their specialty training. Our mutual and dedicated goal as educational institutions is to collaboratively stand with the other medical schools, with Deans Hauptmann and Kahn and Dr. Kuhls, whom you've just heard, to help positively improve the state's physician and healthcare workforce. We are working on this together. 
This bill, if passed, will reduce the motivation of our graduates who are so dedicated to apply to, Nev to Nevada residency programs, thereby reducing the likelihood of Nevada trained physicians to remain in Nevada after they graduate their medical education. As said before, we want to be a magnet for the best medical care and best medical education and a role model in the United States. This bill will have an adverse, yes, a potentially disastrous impact on access and equity to medical care in the state of Nevada. The costs of this provision will raise the cost of medical care altogether for all Nevadans, and the unintended consequences are expected to ultimately result in significant barriers to access and health equity of care in the state of Nevada. We are all in this together for better and more equitable health outcomes. Since 2004, professional liability insurance has been stable and affordable. AB 209 will reverse that situation. For these reasons, Nevada should be very cautious about changing a system that is working. Thank you for your sincere consideration of these thoughts and sentiments on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairperson and uh, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dr. Kimberly Bates. That's K I M. B-E-R-L-Y, last name B as in boy, A-T-E-S. And I'm the program director for the Internal Medicine Residency Program at Dignity Health St. Dominican uh, Hospitals here in uh, Henderson in Las Vegas. I'm also the interim chief medical officer for the Dignity Health um, Medical Group here in Nevada. Uh, lastly, I am a relatively new uh, physician here in uh, Nevada, having moved my family, including my elderly mother and my high school son, here to Nevada a little over a year and a half ago. Um, I've spent the last 20 years of my uh, career training internal medicine physicians and working to bring additional primary care physicians to areas in need like Southern Nevada. I moved here for a purpose. I moved here to actually help create more physicians for, uh, for Nevada. And I've been proud and happy to be here and happy to actually be training some of Dr. Gilliard's students uh, coming in July. So as a two-time breast cancer survivor, I've also been a patient and I understand how traumatic that can be and I appreciate the, the talk and the uh, presentation of the patients that spoke earlier. However, I stand in opposition to this bill. Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican is the only not-for-profit faith-based healthcare system in Southern Nevada, and we will be adversely affected by this bill. Our independent community physician colleagues will be hurt even more. The bill will further damage Nevada's already fragile healthcare system. I'm a practicing physician, and I see this every day in my practice in North Las Vegas. Patients with life-threatening chronic conditions with poor access to healthcare due to clinician shortages and inadequate insurance coverage. Patients wait months to see me as a physician for just routine health care. Nevada has a grossly insufficient number of physicians in the state, and this change will result in losing even more physicians. In my role as a chief medical officer, I hire physicians as well, and I know how difficult it is to recruit excellent physicians to the state. Doctor, this bill will make my job exponentially harder. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much you. for that. With that, we will move to the phones. And again, we have um, broadcasting. Can you open the lines? And on the phones, I believe we have six callers right now. So can we take those first six callers? And then we'll move back to in-person testimony. To provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 209, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Wiz Rizard, W-I-Z-R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. I am the Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity, and we are coming in in opposition to AB 209. I do first want to acknowledge the bill sponsor for, you know, bringing forward uh, a major issue, and we feel very, very uh, sorry for those who have experienced and those who have lost their life due to uh, medical malpractice. Uh, however, in terms of the solution to this problem, we feel that this bill does not address it appropriately. There are already measures in place, such as the license of the individuals that have incurred these types of infractions to be a remedy for those types of issues. 
Uh, more importantly, when we're talking about an industry such as healthcare, we recognize that more government regulations have distorted the market to where it only protects bad actors and it penalizes the good ones, as you've heard here throughout the entire uh, uh, hearing here with great, great doctors who continuously contributed. As everyone has expressed, this will also lead to a less attractive state for healthcare providers, which will lead to our healthcare being even more diminished. So with that said, we do believe that there's solutions in place, tools uh, that we can utilize to effectively target those individuals that are wrongly uh, uh, sharing care to our Nevada patients, uh, while also not penalizing the entire industry. We thank the bill sponsor again for bringing this problem forward, and we thank the uh, chairwoman for uh, running a great meeting and giving everyone about time to express their thoughts. And thank you, committee members. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Justin Sondreger, S-O-N-D-E-R-E-G-E-R. I am a board-certified emergency physician and actually a third-generation Nevada physician. I would like to oppose AB 209. Um, I watched my dad go through uh, the crisis back 20 years ago when he was a family physician and trying to figure out how he was going to meet his well, practice premiums while continuing to serve as a private physician in the state. And now, 20 years later, we're again looking at a bill that will upset the uh, insurance uh, premiums and likely increase all of our medical malpractice drastically to the point where we may have to decide whether or not we can stay in the state and provide good medical care. I would really urge the committee to oppose this and come up with a better solution. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Katrin Ivanov, I V A N O Frank Frank, aka Mrs. Sixit, Assembly District 42. And I am calling in opposition of this bill for everything that just was said. I'll just say Dino. Thank you. Broadcasting, is there anyone else on the line for opposition at this time? Yeah. Hey, this is Dr. Jimmy Shu. I'm one of the general surgeons here in Las Vegas. Uh, That's spelled J-I-M-M-Y. I'm sorry. Uh, last name X-U. Um, I came. I'm sorry, sir. Did you Hello? already speak? No, this okay. is the first time I'm speaking. Okay. I'm sorry. Just because it sounded like I, I thought I heard you say again. Okay. Continue. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I moved to Las Vegas. Uh, uh, my first day on call was actually the night of the October 1st shooting, um, and I was able to serve the many patients that came into our ER at that time. Um, I'm uh, super proud to be a general surgeon. It's the only job I can see myself doing, um, and I'm proud to be here in Nevada uh, to serve the community as I, I really feel like there's a need. Since becoming a general surgeon here, I've hired four more general surgeons, um, including a subspecialist in surgical oncology, which we desperately need here in uh, Las Vegas and Nevada as well. Um, uh, I, 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 again, I'm proud of what we do, but this, um, this AB 209, um, I think would not, uh, complete the goals of, uh, access of, uh, improving access of care to Nevada. Um, just my own experience in my own lawsuit, which I was sued a year and a half out into my own practice, um, uh, where I felt I did everything correct. I, I checked with the senior partner because I was still a new physician. Uh, but the jury found me liable and awarded $10 million against me. So for me, I, you know, I was devastated. I was devastated by the fact that the patient had a bad outcome, you know, and I took that to heart because I'm proud of what I do. And I, I hated seeing a, a horrible complication like that. Um, it, it wasn't my patient, but I was just uh, filling in for one of my, um, one of my other partners at the time. Uh, but the jury found me fully at fault. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, I don't know what to tell young surgeons who come out and they aren't, you know, as experienced or don't have the experience uh, and haven't seen as many cases as they should have. You know, even a young doctor coming out may not be as, 
comfortable with everything. And so to say, oh, be careful and, and don't you know, make any mistakes. I mean, this is the reality of being a physician is there are going to be mistakes made. We need to find ways to prevent these mistakes and improve care overall, but this is not the way to do it. And um, I, I just hope the community takes that into account and um, that we physicians take these cases personally as well. We, you know, it was a double hit to Doctor. that the jury found me, you know, um, li you know, liable as well. All right. Th Sorry thank for going over. Uh, thank you. No, that's okay. Thank you, doctor. And um, it's unimaginable for us to imagine that your first day working here in Nevada was on 1 October. So thank you so much for your service. Broadcasting, is there anyone else on the line? One more, Chair. Thank you. And then we'll return back to Carson City. Hello, my name is Susan Prophet. I'm the Vice President of the, Repub the Nevada Republican Club. Um, I just want to let you know that I agree with everything these doctors and attorneys have been talking about. And for the first time, I actually agree with Planned Parenthood. So, but I've got to tell you, when we moved here five years ago, um, I was assigned to a pediatrician because there weren't enough doctors in Summerlin. Now, I'm 67 years old, and I have specialty needs. I, I have disabilities. None of the doctors would cover that Silver State insurance. So, you know, you should be doing things that would attract these doctors to come back. Um, you know, they've been leaving since COVID lockdown. And um, I'm also an executive recruiter, retired. But um, I can tell you, you're going to need to pay some people some sign-on bonuses and an awful lot more to get them to move here unless you fix our education system and our medical infrastructure as soon as possible. No one is going to want to move here. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. And with that, we'll return back here to Carson City. Please proceed. <coughs> For the record, my name is Dr. Sandra Koch, K-O-C-H, Sandra, S-A-N-D-R-A, and I'm speaking, uh, representing the Nevada section of the American College of OBGYNs. Uh, of course, I'm speaking today in opposition to AB 209. I'm concerned that if this bill passes in any form, we'll be in the same situation that we were in 2002. Uh, research has shown that uh, ca the cap on non-economic damages does not reduce access to the court for individuals with meritorious claims. But if you remove it and the rest of the changes that you have here, we're certainly going to see a significant increase in frivolous lawsuits. Medical malpractice is a very personal matter for health care providers. We all live and die by our complications. I mean, there may be a few exceptions in there, but in general, we care so deeply about what we're doing. We do this because we want to take good care of our patients. And when we have a complication, we don't forget it. It stays with us for our entire careers. Uh, as a healthcare provider and an OBGYN, I have had experience with medical liability. 75% of OBGYNs have be, have, will be sued during the course of their careers. 75% of OBGYNs will have a lawsuit filed against them during their careers. What does that tell you? I think it's really important to think about making changes that will increase the number of lawsuits that are coming at such an underserved community already. Uh, I think that AB 209 will disproportionately affect OBGYNs and their patients. Providers will leave the state. It becomes more difficult to cover very arduous OBGYN call. And increasing cost to providers will cause a shrinking and even more difficulty in accessing longer waiting lists for seeing patients. Um, impact of lawsuits on OBGYNs has been studied. The average OBGYN who sued sees less patients, stops delivering babies sooner, is less likely to take care of more complicated cases. And there's a lot of emotional stress that comes along with it, too. Doctor, your two minutes are... Thank you very much. So I, I'm just going to end by asking you all to vote no on this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you.
My name is Florence Jameson, F-L-O-R-E-N-C-E-J-A-M-E-S-O-N. When I was a young girl, my family was left without access to health care. I have been an obstetrician in Las Vegas for 38 years. I'm the past president of Clark County Medical Society, the Nevada State Medical Association, the Nevada delegate to the AMA, currently chairwoman of the Silver State Exchange. My husband and I founded the largest free healthcare clinic in Nevada, Volunteers in Medicine, serving the underserved poor people, such as I was. Access to healthcare is my passion, and I pray that you understand that this bill is really about access to healthcare. You are well aware of the unintended consequences of bills. In requesting large amounts for pain and suffering or getting rid of joints and several liability, you might as well tell physicians like myself to quit and retire. In requesting volunteer doctors to carry a one three million policy, they will not volunteer to care for the poor. It is that, is that what you really want at a time when almost a quarter million people, Nevadans, are being dropped off Medicaid? We do not want a replay of 2002, a time when I lived through with great agony. My insurance went from thirty to hundred thousand dollars and I thought I'd never practice OB again. 12 of the 17 insurers left the state due to excessive lawsuits. Many of the doctors could not get insurance, creating a healthcare crisis. And in a short period of time, 20% of my colleagues gave up delivering babies, decreased the number of deliveries, left town, and retired. Women traveled to another state and with, without prenatal care. Our infrastructure was collapsing. And in 2004, the people overwhelmingly passed the People's Initiative. They shouted, yes, on three, with an almost two to one victory to maintain access to health care. Right now in Nevada, we have a shortage of obstetricians. One in four women in Nevada do not get prenatal care. And instead of focusing on increased awards, we should think more about how can we get prenatal care to those women and their babies, the unborn children, and reduce Nevada's high maternal deaths. This bill is in the wrong direction, and I know you do not want to see access to health care for you or your constituents decrease. If Doctor? you support 209, What's going Say to happen if we support to it? Doctors okay. And the new medical school, we work so hard to bring doctors. Yes, really, do you want to see decreasing access to health care for your Nevadans? Health care is a right for everyone. If Thank you, you believe doctor. that, oppose 209. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Sally Ann Miles, S A L L Y A N N E M I L E S. And I have been a Northern Nevada resident for the past 26 years. And I'm here this morning as a wife and a mom to speak in opposition to AB 209. My concern is that this bill will impact not only access to health care, but also impact the ability to receive care and treatment in a timely manner. This past year, a member of my family was referred to a specialist. It took us roughly five months to get that appointment scheduled. And the first three providers we had contacted, we were turned away from. Uh, one was retiring and the other two simply weren't accepting patients at the time. And as a mother, five months is a long time to wait simply just to get in and be evaluated for a medical issue. And as a patient, five months is a significant amount of time to wait for answers and to be in treatment. So here in Northern Nevada, we already need more providers. My concern is that this bill will, again, drive out existing providers and uh, deter new providers from coming to our state to help fill these medical needs. And with limited health care providers, our families of Nevada will be faced with less options for care. And with less options, uh, they will fail to receive timely intervention and treatment. So I would ask this committee to consider the impact of this bill and oppose AB 209 in its current form. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Dr. James Breeden, J-A-M-E-S-B-R-E-E-D-E-N. I'm president of Carson Medical Group, an independent physician-owned, not insurance-owned, not hospital-owned medical group in Northern Nevada. I'm a member of the board of directors of Carson Tahoe Regional Medical Center and past president of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I came to Carson City in 1976 and joined two other physicians to practice obstetrics and gynecology. I was here during the liability crisis. I was trying to hire physicians. I saw the marked decrease in access to care. I saw physicians decrease their scope of practice. I saw physicians stop delivering babies. I saw urgent centers close and the trauma center close and physicians retire early. We do not want this again. 
At the time of the liability crisis, Carson Medical Group had grown to 16 physicians, but the threat of lawsuits and the high cost of liability insurance made it very difficult to, to recruit new physicians, especially in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. Then ballot initiative question three was passed in 2004 with over 60% of the vote. Our liability insurance rates stabilized and it became markedly easier to recruit physicians. Carson Medical Group now has 35 physicians and 15 advanced practitioners specializing in family practice, pediatrics and obstetrics and gynecology with offices in Carson City, Reno and Minden. Our ability to bring new physicians to Nevada has markedly increased patient access to care. Unfortunately, Assembly Bill 209 will recreate the liability insurance crisis of the early 2000s and will have the same result, a decreased access to health care, especially for our most underserved and vulnerable patients. So I would urge you please to uh, vote against Assembly Bill 209 and if I can be of any uh, service or answer any questions to any of you, you have my contact information and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And just so you know, members do have a tendency of reaching out. So I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. And we appreciate your offer as well. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Pasternak, A-N-D-R-E-W-P-A-S-T-E-R-N-A-K. I'm a family physician and owner of Silver Sage Center for Family Medicine. I'm also the medical director for access to health care and the past president past president of the Nevada State Medical Association. I am opposed to AB 209. In 1998, my wife, an anesthesiologist, and I moved to Nevada partly because we love the outdoors. Nevada's incredible outdoor landscapes are a joy to explore. Unfortunately, we've also discovered a less appealing desert, Nevada's lack of healthcare professionals. In 2005, I opened my own family medicine office in Reno. A big reason why I waited until 2005 was the malpractice crisis at the time. It scared me away from leaving the hospital system where I was employed, and only after the 2004 legislation did I feel comfortable taking that plunge. Every day, my office gets desperate phone calls from Nevadans who have an insurance card but can't find a family physician. When I do have to refer a patient, wait times for certain specialties can be months. In the past few years, if patients have insurance that allows it, I'm referring them to specialists in California or other neighboring states where they can be seen faster. Unfortunately, my wife's anesthesia group continues to have difficulty recruiting enough anesthesiologists. We heard earlier that increasing malpractice is going to cause physicians to practice differently and improve care. Like so many of the incredible physicians testifying today, I know that when I'm seeing a patient, I'm dedicated to providing them the best care that I can. I care deeply about my patients. Changing the malpractice caps isn't going to result in physicians caring anymore. During this legislative session, I applaud the Senate and Assembly for proposing bills that will turn Nevada from a health care desert into a fertile ground to attract physicians. Passing AB 209 will be like cutting off water we need to create an environment to attract physicians. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Laura Thompson, L-A-U-R-A-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. I am a native Nevadan. I was born and raised in Elko, Nevada. I was educated at the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Um, and ultimately, I chose in 2007 to come back and practice as an OBGYN in Reno. I've been here for 16 years now. I couldn't be happier to be back in the state of Nevada. Um, but. I, I am here in opposition of AB 209. I was in medical school and residency at the time of the malpractice crisis. I had mentors in medical school who basically told me not to come back to Nevada because of the malpractice situation at the time. Um, and I ended up joining a practice up in the state of Washington. But I am a desert girl and a Nevada girl and, and ultimately wanted to be closer to my family, which drew me back in 2007. But I did contact those mentors at that time and said, hey, what, what does it look like for me? Will I be able to succeed? Will I be able to support my family? Will I be able to go to work every day and not be worried that I'm going to have to leave in a year or five years or 10 years? And here we are, 20 years. I fully support a patient's right to a malpractice suit and to fair um, and equitable treatment. I, I practice every day in order to avoid ever being in that situation. 
um, and I'm passionate about the people and the patients of Nevada. I want to continue to be able to recruit. I am right in the heart of my practice um, where I see 10 years down the road. I hope I can retire because there's enough physicians here, but I'm also in the process of recruiting young physicians and I want to make it as um, great as opportunity as I have had to be um, here in Nevada and raise my family and provide good care um, to the people of Reno and the state of Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Patrick Kelly. I'm the CEO of the Nevada Hospital Association. Nevada's hospitals oppose this bill, and we've submitted a detailed letter outlining those. And in exchange for not going through it point by point, I'd ask that you uh, take a look at it and read it. We've talked a lot about the crisis of, 20, uh, of 2004, but we had a crisis in the 1970s as well. And so it seems like we're on this path of every 20 years having a medical malpractice crisis in the state of Nevada. And unfortunately, 2024 is the 20th anniversary. So let's try to avoid that. Many of our hospitals are struggling financially. Nearly half of Nevada's acute care hospitals had a negative operating margin during calendar year 2022. If medical malpractice rates soar, hospitals will be faced with difficult decisions to make on the services they offer or whether they can keep their doors open. Maternity and obstetrical services will be most at risk. One provision of the bill related to joint and several liability encourages lawyers to name as many parties as possible in medical malpractice cases. This takes healthcare providers away from their patients and unnecessarily adds cost. It makes all the defendants jointly liable for damages. Healthcare providers should not be required to pay for the negligence they did not commit. I'm sympathetic to the people who testified here today, but I also think about the tens of thousands of Nevadans who experience pain and suffering every day. They don't have a lawyer and they don't get $350,000 for their suffering. They need access to affordable health care. If this bill passes, they lose. Costs will increase and access will be jeopardized. When you vote on this bill, please keep in mind the interest of all Nevadans, whether they testified today or not. Thank you. And I'll say we're going to finish this table right now and then um, switch back to Las Vegas and then the phones, okay? Good morning, Will Bradley from Las Vegas, retired military officer and consumer of healthcare. And I oppose this bill and the damage has already been done though. It's keeping these doctors away from their patients just to be here and testify. They should be back in the office. Um, and so keep that in mind. Uh, this shouldn't even have gotten this far. Um, now I'm in the middle. My brother is a pulmonologist in Cincinnati who I'm trying to get to move here. And my cousin is the former partner of the now infamous Alec Murdoch, who some of you may have kept up with that trial. One thing that came out in that trial, and he's not the murderer, Murdoch is, <laughs> One thing that came out in that trial is their average pay in a small town in South Carolina for medical malpractice for attorneys was $1.3 million a year. The average pay for ER doc, 250000 a year. There, you talk about inequality. Here you go. So we have, well, we have to stop, frankly, people like my cousin from suing more and more often and higher. Um, and I want to point out this slide is wrong. If you go to Medicare.gov, there are three hospitals in Southern Nevada with a three-star rating, Mountain View, St. Rose, and Southern Hills Hospital. So I, I don't know who do this slide, but it's not proper to put up wrong information on such an important bill like this. So go to Medicare.gov, search hospitals, and you'll see a much different story than this slide uh, shows. So uh, thank you for your time and your service, and Please oppose this bill to allow people like me to effectively consume what these talented people are offering. Thanks. Uh, Chair, Chair Miller, members of the committee, Connor Kane, C O N N O R C A I N, on behalf of Sunrise Hospital and Sunrise Children's Hospital, Mountain View Hospital, and Southern Hills Hospital, in opposition to Assembly Bill 209. As a preliminary matter, we appreciate the sponsor's open door policy and willingness to listen to our concerns. I would also, as, as many have before me, 
like to acknowledge the patients in the room. Thank you for being here to tell your story. Sunrise is our state's largest safety net hospital, providing critical service, services to the most vulnerable members of our community who often have nowhere else to go. Many of you have visited Sunrise and you've seen this with your own eyes. I would respectfully disagree with one of the proponents of Assembly Bill 209 who characterized some of the changes under this bill as not really having any kind of consequence. On the contrary, AB 209 is a proposal that was deliberately construed and unfortunately threatens access to critical services for our most vulnerable patients and communities. We urge you to oppose this bill. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Joan Hall, H-A-L-L. -L representing Nevada Rural Hospital Partners and LICON. We represent 13 critical access hospitals in rural and frontier Nevada. I remember the MedMal insurance issue in the early 2000s as I was the CEO at Arrington Hospital. At that time, we had obstetricians who did a rural route and provided pro bono care, prenatal care, to our um, community members during this malpractice initiative, they determined they could no longer continue to provide that care. I fear that history is going to repeat itself by stripping the safety net protections currently in statute. This will cause increased malpractice insurance premiums, it surely will, and that in turn will cause providers to leave the state. Access to care in rural and frontier areas will be negatively impacted. We already struggle with recruiting and retaining specialists such as OBGYNs, PEDS, and ER physicians. This legislative body has many bills attempting to correct our poor rankings. Passage of this bill will do the exact opposite. Please do not pass 209. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go back to um, Las Vegas, we only have two callers on the line, so I'd like to give them an opportunity right now. Broadcasting, can you open up the lines for the next two callers? To testify in neutral to Assembly Bill 209, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Apologies, to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 209, please press star nine. There are no callers choosing to testify in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, let's go back to Las Vegas. And can you raise your hand if you're still waiting to testify there in Las Vegas? I know we have two at the table. Is there anyone else or are you the last two? Raise your hand if you're testifying in opposition in Las Vegas. Okay, so I think you might be our last two there. Please proceed. Thank you and good morning. My name is Re Rebecca Herrero, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-H-E-R-R-E-R-O. -E -R -R -E -R um, I am a board certified OBGYN who has been practicing in Las Vegas for the last 25 years. For the last three years, I have also had the um, pleasure of being the CEO of Women's Health Associates of Southern Nevada. We are an 82 provider healthcare organization that includes 42 physicians and 42 advanced practice providers who serve the women in Southern Nevada. Based on the 2021 vital statistics from the Southern Nevada Health District, we delivered about one in three babies in 2021. I was practicing as an OBGYN in the MedMal crisis in 2002. At this time, I was in a group of three physicians, and one of my partners had to stop practicing obstetrics. It was devastating <clears throat> for me personally and for my other partner. At the time, I had a three-, five-, and six-year-old uh, six year olds <clears throat> in the house and was trying to be both a doctor and a mother. After a few months of doing grueling uh, OB call every other night and every other weekend, I turned to my husband and I said, I just can't do this anymore. Thankfully, an end came to it, and the third partner was able to practice obstetrics again, and we remained. Fast forward to today, our state still suffers from a continuous shortage of women's health care providers. Access to health care for women in our state is very difficult. 
As the leader of my organization, I'm constantly being called saying we have waits of two to four months for patients to get in for routine gynecologic care. Obviously, in a pregnancy situation, to wait two to three months to start prenatal care is untenable. Patients need care sooner than that uh, for both the safety of themselves and for the safety of their newborns. Anything that has the possibility of increasing our medical malpractice rates will exacerbate the access issue that we currently suffer from. OBGYNs already have extraordinary med mal rates. Further increases will most probably cause a repeat of the early 2000s, in which physicians either ceased practicing, had to cut off their obstetrical practices, retire, or leave the state. Excuse me, your two minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Dr. Keith Brill, K-E-I-T-H-B-R-I-L-L. In 2002, I was a board-certified OBGYN physician at Nellis Air Force Base here in Las Vegas. So I got to watch the malpractice crisis here from a unique perspective. And having a shortage back then of providers, I was recruited pretty heavily to try to stay here in Nevada. And the first thing I said is, why in the world would I stay here? There's so many places I trained on the East Coast, I can go elsewhere and not have to deal with the crisis. But fortunately, things have changed. And I stayed here, and I'm so happy I did. I ended up heading the Clark County Medical Society, the NSMA, and also ACOG here in Nevada. And also, I'm the current chief of medical staff at Henderson Hospital. And most importantly, I'm on call right now for my practice. And I have people I probably need to run to any minute here, but I'm doing my best to, to make my statement in opposition. I can tell you that as an OBGYN, one of our most dreaded days is a Monday morning because we expect phone calls from patients who went to the ER over the weekend because they couldn't access any OBGYNs at all. And they show up late in pregnancy. They show up with miscarriages, ectopic pregnancies, ovarian tumors, people who had no access to medical care. And then they call us on Mondays to try to get in because we cover so many emergency rooms here. I can tell you that nowadays we cover these emergency rooms every day and we get these phone calls every day and it's sad to see the lack of access and I can tell you that if this kind of a bill went through the situation would worsen again. I wish I could say it was as simple as saying that these caps alone would increase doctors coming to Nevada but as we've heard it's multifactorial and overworked doctors don't exactly encourage other doctors to come here and do the same exact job. We are in such a situation now where we're overworked that we need so many more doctors that this kind of bill will just negatively impact our ability to recruit. I also want to make a comment that I'm unaware of any med medical malpractice insurance companies owning practices or owning hospitals. That was a question to the attorney earlier. Last thing is that bad outcomes happen, unfortunately, to every physician, no matter the best physicians in, the, in our community or the country. But that does not equate to malpractice or negligence. And without some limitations on frivolous lawsuits Doctor? and need for meritorious claims, Doctor? this will be the defer. The, You're thank too you. This will deter our doctors from coming here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Julie Herfer, J-U-L-I-E-H-E-R-E-F-O-R-D, co-founder of Nevada's Ken Citizen Action Network. I'm not a healthcare professional. I'm just a regular retired citizen that is concerned about our healthcare standing in the country. It's being in the bottom. And I hear all the horror story from friends and neighbors that I know that have to wait months to get care. So I won't waste any more time to repeat all the great, excellent point made by the healthcare experts and professionals. We like to echo their opposition and ask for you to vote no on AB 209. Thank you very much for our time to voice our concern. Absolutely, thank you for your testimony. Good morning, my name is Pauline Lee, spelled P-A-U-L-I-N-E, last name Lee, L-E-E. -E. I am a physician spouse and come from a family of physicians. Both my siblings are physicians and one is married to another physician. I have uncles and cousins who are physicians and my own father was a medical school professor in biochemistry. 
I'm speaking on behalf of my husband who is working today and expected to work on about eight procedures to provide comfort and care for eight patients. My husband graduated from a top 10 medical school in a top residency program in Texas. He also finished his training at Cedar sinai Hospital as the top cardiology fellow. We chose to move to Nevada in 1997 so he could start his cardiology practice. Less than four years into his new cardiology practice, the St. Paul's companies, which insured 60% of the state's doctors, began canceling its malpractice insurance policies. We had to make a decision. Should we move? Should we recalibrate and move back to California? He wanted to make a huge difference in this new state of his. We had adopted Nevada as our home. Thankfully, in 2004, Nevadans responded by overwhelmingly passing the Keep Our Doctors in Nevada Act, which, which helped our doctors to recalibrate and decide that, yes, we do want to continue practicing in Nevada. <coughs> AB 209 will eliminate valuable medical malpractice reforms, which allow the state to retain its physicians. This is not a threat. It is a current reality. AB 209 is an insult to all physicians because it is meant to punish the few bad apples in the cadre of wonderful doctors here in Nevada. But the problem is punishing the very few bad apples ruins the entire, and the entire apple cart. Without a medical legal panel, which we had before 2004, and without a reasonable cap on pain and suffering, AB 209 will drive all physicians out of the market. Simply put, with Medicare and health insurance reimbursements at all-time lows, it is simply too expensive to practice medicine. It is too frustrating to be in a market which fosters and encourages frivolous lawsuits. Ma'am, your two minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, uh, Assemblyman. Thank you. Is there... Anyone else in Las Vegas that would like to testify in opposition? Okay. Back here to Carson City, please. Good morning, uh, Chair Miller, uh, members <coughs> of the Assembly Committee on Judiciary. My name is Brian Walker. I serve as the Senior Vice President of the Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, we do represent uh, several different varieties and delivery methods of, of health care, including uh, doctor's offices, veterinarians, uh, pharmacies. Um, in fact, um, we have been supportive of this legislature's um, intent and ability to increase access to health care um, by allowing uh, new, different, um, and effective services to be had um, in these alternative health care uh, facilities. Uh, we are strongly concerned um, that this bill, if you pass it, uh, will reverse that trend. Um, and we believe that would do a disservice uh, to our Nevada citizens and constituents um, who are located in areas of, of our state that are uh, health care deserts. Um, the second uh, concern we have uh, on AB 209 is that medicine, um, health care, uh, is a logistical supply chain. Um, and any time that you are increasing the cost or inputs along that supply chain, um, you are inevitably going to end up uh, with a reflective increase in cost. And so while we've heard today that many of these physicians might leave, um, it's certainly not the case of all of them. But those that are here are going to have to reflect those increased costs um, as well as the potential liability down the road um, as they are pricing themselves um, in this market. Um, and lastly, we would suggest that because this was uh, done by a vote of the people um, and ultimately it was, it was their will um, that we are currently operating under, uh, we would strongly consider um, perhaps moving this and, and allowing the voters to have a, a say in this during the next election. Um, and for those reasons, ma'am, we would urge you to oppose uh, AB 209. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Paul Moratkin with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is, is opposed to the provisions of AB 209. We believe the repeal of the standards that have been proposed will cause significant damage to our health care system throughout our state. As many of you know, the Chamber is the state's largest business association, and we have over 70 different sectors in our membership that employ over 200,000 Nevadans that rely on our state's health care system throughout our communities. We believe that this legislation will impact those families in a negative way and cause exasperation that already exists in our health care system. We believe that 209, if passed, will create a similar situation that we had over 20 years ago, and we believe that this is not the right approach for our state and our community, 
it will add additional challenges to our labor shortages we have in health care. As we know, every single state in this country needs more doctors or nurses, and we're constantly in competition with those other neighboring states and throughout the country, and your legal climate does impact those decisions where doctors go, where businesses relocate, and, where, and if they expand to grow or not. Those are all real economic factors in this conversation. But there's also the human side, and you've heard this from those physicians today that testified in opposition to the bill. They are those heroes on the front line every single day helping our Nevada families, and we urge this body to please oppose to AB 209. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Miller, members of the committee. My name is Tom Clark. I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Society of Dermatologists and Dermatological Surgeons, as well as the 2,300 plus members of the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. I've been working in the healthcare field in this building for about five legislative sessions now. And every session, the bills that we are working on are the bills that are going to advance and make a pathway for physicians to want to come here, whether it's licensure, the way they practice, all of those places that we know will make Nevada the state that will want that doctors will want to come to and practice, what, regardless of what field, especially in dermatology. The passage of AB 209 will eliminate all of that work that we've been doing. And that scares me because there is a lot of really good legislation currently being heard that is intended to do just that, to make it so that Nevada is a place where doctors want to practice. We urge your opposition to this bill. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, my name is Pat Fries, F-R-I-E-S, and I'm here, I want to go against, I guess, the bill for uh, about the nurses. I am a retired RN. I have mal medical malpractice insurance, one million, three million, as a retired RN, I'm still paying $85 a year, not working. I'm afraid that if the nurse's uh, name stays in there, that the nurses have to have it, that the nurses like LPNs and RNs will not be able to afford it because I don't know what it would be now if I were still working. So I would definitely like to see that taken out and um, I'll uh, oppose um, Bill uh, 209. Thank you. Uh, let me be the first to wish you a good afternoon. Chair, members of the committee, Elliot Mallon, uh, for the record, on behalf of the Nevada Osteopathic Medical Association, we too are in opposition, um, and instead of echoing a lot of what my colleagues have said, which we agree with, uh, I wanna share with you a board member, about a board member that we have. He is a uh, DO in Washoe County in Reno. He is also a part-time physician in Mineral County because we don't have access to physicians uh, and care in that county. We fear that if this bill were to go through, um, we will lose that access to care in Mineral County and many of our, of our other rural counties, as well as in our urban areas. Um, and so ditto to everything else and thank you for uh, the time today. Chairman Miller and esteemed members of the committee, I'm Jerry Matsumura, M-A-T-S-U-M-U-R-A, past president of the Nevada State Society of Anesthesiologists, representing the State Society of Anesthesiologists in opposition of AB 209. I was gonna leave it ditto, but I just wanted to add one comment to a previous testimony that stated there's errors in that sign. <clears throat> if you go to Las Vegas Review Journal, August 23rd, 2022, the report that rather than 94% of Nevada hospitals having a one-star ranking, it's really 30%. Now, I'm not gonna say that's outstanding because that's still the highest in the country, but it's certainly far from 94% having a one-star rating. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, 70% of the hospitals in Nevada have greater than a one-star rating instead of just one. Thank you. Madam Chairman and members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Dr. Tim McFerrin, I'm an OBGYN. As you can see by the gray hair, I've been practicing for a long time. Um, my heart, first of all, my heart goes out to those who spoke earlier about their medical care. And I'm truly sorry for the uh, grief and pain that, the, that they and their families um, <clears throat> have suffered. And secondly, Joan, I was the OB that went to Yarrington every other Wednesday to try to serve that population, but um, had to stop because <clears throat> Carson City didn't have any OBs either. Our medical liability system is broken. AB 209 will not fix it and will not prevent any bad outcomes. In fact, passage of AB 209 will actually increase risk for patients by um, 
exacerbating the shortage of doctors and nurses. For the health of Nevada, please oppose AB 209, and instead, let's work together to fix the medical crisis. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in opposition? I'm afraid to ask this again. Is, is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in opposition? Okay. And again, I just want to be clear, there's no one else in Las Vegas that wants to testify in opposition. I see we still have a few people there and always that very coveted seat right behind the pole. Um, <laughs> with that broadcasting, I will open up the lines for anyone else who wants to testify in opposition. If you would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 209, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. C-Y-R-U-F-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Thank you. I oppose this bill. Zero previous comments. Thank you so much. Next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 534. Please press star six to unmute your phone. Um, my name is Dr. Peter Caravella, C-A-R-A-V-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Um, I'm a partner of Dr. Shu who spoke earlier. Um, I think all the stories uh, reverberate with all of us um, that have been in this community for as many years as I have. I think what it comes down to is the fact that um, we all understand that this is a numbers game and uh, trial lawyers have much more money to throw at the legislature than we do. Um, that's great and it's all fine and dandy, but when we can't afford to practice anymore and you're racing your kid to the ER with appendicitis and we're not available for you, you might as well just get their number off the billboard to see if they can come in and help you because that's what this is going to come down to. We're already stretched thin financially from a malpractice standpoint and it's only going to continue to get worse. So um, I think we all understand what the, the, the politics are here. And obviously, uh, myself and, and my partners all oppose this. And it's really not going to be tenable to continue to practice here, um, as others have said. So hopefully we can come together. I think one thing that I think Ms. Lee said a while ago is that the screening panel would be a great idea to have back on to eliminate a number of these frivolous lawsuits. I've been involved in 10 to 12 lawsuits in my life, never have paid the diamond indemnity knock on wood, and none of them actually have ever gone to trial yet. My malpractice premiums go up every year because I'm tagged with a frivolous lawsuit being misnamed and named incorrectly, never seen a patient, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things I think that needs to have to happen, irrespective of whether this bill passes or not, is get the screening committee back with both doctors and lawyers on it that have sensible measures um, to put in place so we can stop a lot of this frivolous, um, uh, the frivolous suits that go on on a daily basis. Thank you. There are no other callers choosing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you, broadcasting. So with that, then I will go ahead and close testimony on opposition, and I will open it up for testimony in neutral. Again, remember, neutral is neutral, <laughs> not thinly disguised opposition. I promise. I believe you. Barry Cole, <laughs> B-A-R-Y-C-O-L-E, retired whatever. Um, you've heard a lot about the past. You've heard a lot about the future. We've heard about the suffering that's occurring now. We've heard about the future hardship. If you're fans of the John Wick franchise, you know that his nickname was the Boogeyman. There's a boogie woman we should actually be concerned about. Her name is Haley Van Arum. She's the U.S. attorney in Maryland 
who notified us we violated the Americans with Disability Act because we're shipping young kids and adolescents out of state for their mental health services. We're shipping them out because we don't have enough child and adolescent psychiatrists. We don't have enough beds to put them in. In private conversation with the Nevada Psychiatric Association, the general, um, our government affairs committee, she made it real clear what her agenda was. We get this year to sort this all out. Next year, she's hauling us into federal court, and she's going to seek a consent decree. I witnessed that in Hawaii when I practiced there, first against the state hospital and then against Kaiser Permanente. When, they're, when you're under a consent decree, they see everything. What little they thought they had becomes a lot when they can look at everything. So whether or not we can resolve AB 209 positively or negatively, there's another agenda at the federal level. And I just want to remind us the clock on that is also ticking, and it's not going away. I hope that was neutral enough. It was very neutral. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else that would like to testify in neutral here in Carson City? Is there anyone that would like to testify in neutral there in Las Vegas? Broadcasting, will you open the lines, please? To testify in neutral to Assembly Bill 209, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you so much. With that, I will go ahead and close testimony on Assembly Bill 209, and I will welcome back our bill sponsor for any final remarks. Thank you so much for the opportunity to hear this important issue and to give victims and families their time and space required to tell their heartbreaking stories. Thank you for your willingness to step up and do the right thing by giving Nevadans the ability to hold the medical system accountable, ultimately protecting their quality of care. I'd also like to thank Dr. Tony Alamo for being here today. His long service to the state chairman of the Gaming Commission, chairman of the Athletic Commission, and a longtime reputation for serving our communities and his leadership will leave a lasting impression for Nevadan for years to come. As for the rest of what we saw today, I wanna to thank every and every doctor for being here for their service. However, I wanna be very clear. There is no correlation whatsoever between medical malpractice caps in a state and the number of doctors per capita in that state. Contrary to the opposition testimony you heard just recently, there are 23 states in the District of Columbia without medical malpractice caps at all. And in all of those, in fact, five states have medical malpractice caps lower than Nevada. Our caps are not the norm. In fact, they're significantly lower than the norm. And yet doctors do not leave those states. There are insurance companies providing coverage in those states, and more importantly, it actually appears that care in those states are better than those with caps. As I said in my opening, we are 50th in the U.S. in primary care physicians per capita. We also rank 49th in specialists per capita. But what about the rest of the country? Four out of five states in specialists per capita are states without medical malpractice caps, without any caps. Nine of those bottom Nine of the bottom 10 states are states with caps. So what does that mean? It is clear the concern that lifting the cap will result in physicians leaving Nevada. However, that is not supported by any data. And in fact, the data suggests the opposite. While we are short on doctors, today's hearing is not about that. And nationally, there's absolutely no connection between doctors per capita and malpractice limits as the data has proved. To this point in another way, to point this in another way, We've given our, up our rights, and we've gotten nothing in return. It's very easy, and I'm sure you've heard right sitting in this three-hour hearing, to make this a fight about doctors and lawyers. But that's not why we're here today. We're here today for victims to seek justice. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm simply a woman who ran for office to fight for justice, and it's why I'm here before you today. Chair Miller. Your members ask great questions, and I really appreciate that. I think that makes us better lawmakers and better decision makers 
when we ask those tough questions. But when we talk about holding people accountable, it's important to remember our role in this process. You know, I really liked the, um, the metaphor of a teacher being sued for an IEP violation because for decades we've talked about how holding teachers accountable in this building. But a school district is much different than a healthcare system. We elect trustees to hold districts accountable to our needs as a community, and we have a say in that. We have a say here at the legislature when we elect members of this committee or people like myself. However, citizens who oversee that system and try to bend and shape it to make it sure it's delivering for all Nevadans is a work in process and it's everything we do here. This is not about how the healthcare system works. Instead of it being ran by citizens, the healthcare system is ran by a complex network of corporations, which you've heard from, insurance companies, hospital networks, that move billions of dollars every day. These are much these are as much financial institutions as they are healthcare providers, as one of the members in this committee pointed out during the hearing. And these populations don't get to serve, I'm sorry, and they don't get to elect people in these positions. Our community does not get to do that. Instead, this is a system that has gone so large that when we pass a new law, they make it a mere suggestion. We appoint a medical board to oversee doctors, but the medical board has had open cases for years, leaving malpractice unchecked. We've had virtually no oversight in these massive institutions, hospitals, and insurance companies. The court system, sadly, is how we as, system, we as citizens have a check on corporate power. We don't get to elect hospital boards, as I mentioned. We don't get to set their policies, but we do get to control who and how these cases get filed. These laws were passed when I was just 10 years old and have basically been left untouched since. And what was the result? Did we get more doctors? No. Did we get better care? No. All Nevada hospitals, except for the three mentioned, have the lowest rating Medicare can give. This, le this real legacy of these 20-year-old laws is that the medical malpractice carriers in this state, as mentioned, the insurance companies, have appreciated an average of 45% profit margins in the last 15 years, while still raising insurance premiums for healthcare providers. You've heard from numerous doctors, whether they had an infraction or not, their rates continue to go up. The cost of trial came up today and I wanted to make sure that we address that. We have to understand in all, a cost proceeding with a case like this runs in excess of $200,000 before a trial even occurs. Depositions, consulting, retaining experts, document review take time and energy while the healthcare system can spend unlimited time and resources on this. The caps in place effectively cap how far a victim can go in seeking justice. Again, the system has put a cap on what they want and victims have no choice in the matter. These insurance companies do not respond to pleas. They do not take a look in their patients' eyes or talk to the families who they have denied. They speak in bottom line, in dollars and cents, and you've heard that today. Give Nevadans the ability to speak this language by allowing them access to the courts and justice, and I urge your support for Assembly Bill 209. Thank you. Thank you so much. And first, I would like to release our vice chair. She has a committee to chair and Assemblyman Yurick and Assemblywoman Hardy who need to get to their next committee. Um, with that, thank you for your final remarks. Ms. Morris, do you have any final remarks? Thank you so much. All right, with that, we will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 209. Thank you. Um, the final thing on our agenda today is public comment. So if there's anyone wishing to make public comment, again, public comment is about anything that's under the purview of the committee, but not related to any bill heard that day. So is there anyone here in Carson City who would like to make public comment? Is there any, okay, please proceed. And is there anyone there in Las Vegas that would like to make public comment? Okay, just so that you all in Las Vegas know, we are losing video conferencing in 10 minutes. So if we all go blank at 1215, you know why. Excuse me. Um, we're in the middle of public comment. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, Dr. James Breeden, B-R-E-E-D-E-N. I just wanted to I've run a number of meetings. I'd like to congratulate the chair on running an excellent meeting. And I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and uh, the time that you're going to devote for this uh, difficult decision. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. 
Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Not seeing anyone else here in Carson City or in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, will you open the lines, please? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to provide public comment at this time. Okay, thank you for that. Then with that, we will go ahead and um, close public comment. We have actually accomplished all of the work today. Thank you members for the work session and for of course your questions and your engagement during this hearing. Um, with that, we tomorrow um, will come in, let's try 8.30 tomorrow morning. Can we do nine? All right, let's do nine. But that means we got to be ready to go so that we can get through this stuff. So I will see you all back at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>